Welcome to the Talking Dead. It is December 17th, 2011, and I am Jason. This is Bob. Drinking as always. I was always going to say it like that. <laughs> You're drunk. No, I In this don't. episode, an intervention. And we have a very, very, very special guest online, Mr. Ross. How are you? Uh, yes, hi, Ross Payton here, yes, Ross author Payton. of Zombies of the World. Yes. Uh, a great, uh, happy to be here. Yeah, he wrote, um, as you mentioned, Zombies of the World, A Field Guide to the Undead. And I have to say, um, it's an excellent book. I love the artwork in it. I know, I know Thank that's, you. And I, I know that's a, a bad way to start off. <laughs> but the pictures <laughs> yeah, are great. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff that you didn't do, that was great. Yeah. Uh, no. uh, yeah. But no, that was the very first thing that caught my eye because uh, when I got a copy, I, you know, I, I flipped through it real quick um, in PDF form. And because the, the, the first things that you see are the, you know, the cover of the book, which is awesome. Yeah. It kind of has a feel of a, of a graphic novel. Yeah. Um, you open it up and it's just, it's like the detail in the artwork is, is really amazing. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I was incredibly lucky to get the artist that I did for Zombies of the World. I had uh, five different artists work on it. The majority of it was done uh, by a, a Canadian artist named uh, Tom Rhodes, who's now working. I contacted him when he was in art school, uh, finishing up art school in 2009, and he agreed to do it. And then uh, his first job is now he's working for BioWare doing concept uh, art for Mass Effect and other video games. Wow. So uh, I, I had that slim oppor- margin of opportunity where I could, you know, get him uh, to work on something freelance before he was snatched <laughs> up by a corporation that could pay him what he deserves, awesome. you know, not a lot. Uh, but yeah, he, he did a phenomenal job with that. He also did the logo on the front cover and the 20 major species. Um, not the artwork of the, or not the zombies on the front cover, but just the very Baroque, you know, zombies of the world. Yeah. Uh, so. So, yeah. It's very well done. And congratulations on slipping that in before you got <laughs> <laughs> snatched away. Yeah. Like corporate America. Well, Canada, I guess. <laughs> Canada. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, and then the, the other artists, uh, Ian Moody and Violet Kirk, uh, did the, the rest, of, most of the other artwork. I had two other artists do a couple other pieces. But uh, Ian and Violet are both podcast fans, fans of the podcast, Role Playing Pop Radio, that I do. Uh, and they approached me about doing some projects, and then you know we started working on various things, and then uh, they just like, oh, hey, do you want to do some stuff for Zombies of the World? And, yes, and that that led to that. So, um, yeah, no, I was like, this book wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't have gotten all these reviews uh, and notice if it, it if it didn't have this artwork. But I, I kind of envision it as a very graphic, uh, not a graphic novel, but a very visual book uh, yeah. to sort of make juxtapose it against all the other zombie guys which are just you know uh i love the zombie survival guide but it's just you know very minimalist illustrations with very minimalist text and yeah. kind of i want to do the other route something more lavish well what also makes this book great is not just the pictures um the detail um to each of the, the you know species of, of zombies that you mentioned i love how it's reading it it's kind of like a a train ride through all your favorite zombie movies that, <laughs> that fill in the gaps that, you know, you, you've always asked yourself like, well, why does this happen in this? And, you know, it's always like tipping the hat to, you know, the genre that we love. I mean, I, I love yeah. um, the punk zombies, the talking zombies. <laughs> um, good reference to that. And the dancing zombies. Reference Return too. of the Living Dead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah no, I... Um, the genesis of it began with a uh, sort of observation in the zombie genre, which has been established by you know, Romero in the canon, I guess, so to speak, is that zombies don't digest their food. They don't eat. I mean, they eat, but they don't like get fuel from it. If, if they eat somebody's you know, face, that face will just rots in their stomach or falls out. Yeah. So uh, this is sort of a subtle thing, but like zombies never, you know, except in 28 days later, they never starve to death either. So the zombies stay animate for, you know, years and years and years. But how, how do they keep moving? Doesn't this violate the laws of physics, you know, this, you know thermodynamics and all that. So I kind of started thinking about like, well, if zombies were real, you know, this is not, not a good uh, science starter. Like, what if zombies were real? And, 
uh, I sort of started d doing some world building from that and that observation. Well, if that were true, then the scientists would want to figure out why that was and they would try to uh, exploit that. So I kind of started thinking more and more about it and try I just kept building up on this and – uh, I eventually got to the idea, well, why, why wouldn't there be speciation? Why is there only one type of zombie? Uh, why wouldn't there be, you know, multiple types to evolve for different environments? You know, a, a desert zombie, you know, i.e. a mummy or a, um, you know, a zombie to deal with urban environments or something, you know, something more intelligent. Uh, and it, it kind of went from there. And then, of course, I wanted to touch on all the major. Uh, so first I decided I took all these ideas and I was like, hey, well, I know I'll do a web series for it. And so I shot some videos in 2009, and then after that, I still had lots and lots of material for it. And I had this, and Tom Rosa did the art, which was for the web series originally, and then for the poster. Uh, and then I was like, well, why don't I just uh, make a book out of it? Because I have the graphic design skills, and you know, I can. I, uh, and I saved up some money to pay for it, and uh, I spent the next year and a half, you know writing and designing and getting the illustrations for it and that kind of led to this and here we are so but i wanted to touch on all the so the 20 species each one represents some sort of archetypal zombie um either from movies or some sort of undead creature from folklore mythology obviously there's a haitian zombie the the original voodoo zombie uh where we get the word zombie uh and then you know there are more uh esoteric things like well not the, the Dragoor is pretty esoteric, I, I guess, until Skyrim. Once Skyrim came out, everyone knows what a Dragoor <laughs> is now. And uh, then there's, you know, the Revenant, uh, the Chinese hopping corpse. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the movie zombies, like the the talking zombie or the uh, Egyptian mummy or, well, I guess that's a little bit of both, um, you know, folklore yeah. <laughs> or mythology. Well, and, you also have the reference to, like, Jason Voorhees type. Yeah, the Revenant. Um, they're, the Revenant, he's undead. He kills people. You know, he he's not a. The main thing is, that undead kills people and doesn't suck blood. You know, is not a vampire because I don't want to put it in vampires because then they would just get convoluted and yeah. you know that. And there's now sparkling vampires and I didn't want to have to reference them. <laughs> so you don't want to go just, there. Uh, so but, I stuck to zombies. I stuck to with what I was more comfortable with. And that was one thing but, I was let down that there was not sparkling zombies. Well, no, I mean, vampires. Kidding. There's there's a ton of vampire myths and a ton of different types of vampires, and you could do you know vampires of the world, but that would be an entire separate book. I mean that that, and then you would then have to, and the zombie. The other idea is like zombies are for the most part dumb, so like you treat them like animals, not as people. So they don't have civil rights, for example, but. I have in there. They're endangered species for the most part. So, yeah. like, there are zombie conservation sets. Some species are threatened. You can't just shoot all the zombies because, you know, what if we've run out of them? We, <laughs> which people are like, well, isn't that a good thing? But, well, the other thing is, of course, scientists are studying them because, again, like I mentioned earlier, the zombies are uh, – energy you know violating laws of physics well why can't we exploit them? why can't we learn how to exploit that energy exploit harness them for the good of mankind so in the end of the book and on the web series i i, I show that you know scientists would be setting up like some way to get electricity from zombies like yeah. put them on stationary bicycles and show them a picture of brains <laughs> and they'll keep pedaling towards it because and they'll never get tired because and they're you'll they'll never start, stop pedaling because they're dumb zombies so like we have green energy from it so uh and well, you, then of course you know medical research is they're 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 immortal why can't we be immortal from that so um a partial zombification might you know uh, uh imp solve all kinds of medical problems so that that's kind of the, the world building i did and, and it kind of grew into this thing where you know if zombies were real i think it would be closer to what i, I imagine than the the, the neither living dead scenario which is you know zombies appear instantly from nowhere and they instantly overwhelm the earth or they overwhelm the earth in like a matter of days and I imagine, yeah, zombies showing up would be pretty cataclysmic, but I don't think we would be you – know, civilization is a little more resilient than that. And I don't think how, – how would zombies get there that quickly? I mean how would they instantly overwhelm us? Uh, I mean how did they show up in the first place? So why, where did they evolve from? I mean things don't spontaneously generate out of nothingness. Yeah. So anyways, that, that was my thinking with Zombies of the World. Unless you're interviewing uh, the people from our other show and, and – Never mind. It's anyway. Um, but <laughs> I, I do like the fact that you know you, you take the you take the scientific aspect of there, and you have some very famous scientist doctors on there, like Doctor West. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Again, I tried to throw, and then for the zombie fans, of course, for the genre fans, I threw in as many homages and references 
as I could. I made them as oblique and as weird as possible. <laughs> so like, you know, yeah, there's references to Herbert West reanimator. Yeah. Uh, there's references to Fulci and all those other, you know, Italian film directors. Uh, and then there's are there are references to there's one that's to really oblique to a Mexican horror film. Um, I don't know if you did you catch that one? The, yeah. I, the, I didn't. Which one are you talking I about? I didn't catch until after I read a previous interview where you talked about it. And then I went, oh. <laughs> um, there's a 1957 film called The Robot versus the Aztec Mummy. And as I said, the mummy is a type of zombie, really. Yeah. You know, a desert zombie. So the Aztec in the movie, a scientist makes uh, a robot to kill an Aztec mummy so he can steal the a Aztec mummy's gold. Not, you know, like if you can build a robot, why can't you just sell the robot and, you know, make money <laughs> from that? But like, regard, That's disregarding that, because uh, they do show the robot's pretty competent, can kill hobos. I mean, they literally show him murdering a hobo by having the robot electrocute him as a test. And like, yes, excellent. Go and kill the mummy. And they find the mummy wins, but. Um, and it's a terrible movie, but it's just so ridiculous. I had to throw in a reference there. So the Aztec <laughs> mummy is the one species of zombie that's extinct, and uh, because robots, I had robots as an invasive species uh, oh, that came along with conquistadors and just wiped them out, you know. And so I had to put in this reference. Oh, there's time traveling robots everywhere, but we're going to ignore those. Let's go back to zombies. So because <laughs> that's your that's your next book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's I'll very funny. I, um, I work in a, at an independent video store. And um, yeah. we have that movie, and and, yeah. I, and I've always I always kind of looked at it, and went eh, I don't know, but now I'm definitely gonna watch it. <laughs> there's I would recommend there's a mystery science. The reason I saw it as an episode of Mystery Science Theater. Yeah, that, that's what we have the MST3K. Yeah, and that that like the movie by itself is pretty. It's only like over an hour long, but it's you know a Mexican B movie from 1957. <laughs> that's you're not great. you're not gonna get a whole lot out of it unless you're really you know, well. You are drinking right now, so yeah, I yeah. guess you know. <laughs> you, uh, uh, carry on with that, but um, it's it's I kind of I, I when I first did the web series, I wanted to put in a clip of that, but I looked it up. I thought it was public domain, but it wasn't public domain. So I had really? to stage my own Aztec versus robot, <laughs> uh, Aztec mummy versus robot fight, and uh, so that was kind of complex. That sounds uh, more fun than just putting up the clip, though. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, uh, you can get, get links. I put them all. All the episodes are up on YouTube right now. I'll probably shoot some more video uh, in the future to keep it up. But um, yeah, shooting video is really like time consuming and you have to get a lot of people and you know it, it's it's uh, writing a book is a, is much easier for me because it's a solitary pursuit i could just write and you know lay it out in indesign uh without having to get you know 10 people to show up at 8 in the morning to start shooting or you know six in the morning to start shooting yeah and they're all looking at me like i'm not paying any of you because i can't afford <laughs> to <laughs> so so how did uh, you how did your get book get picked up did you shop it around or did you have like I self-published it. Uh, like I said, I saved up some money uh, for for a print run of it. I have a background in graphic design, so I know some of the printers out there. So I, I chose a printer called Tinwall Press. They're in Singapore. Uh, and then I just paid them, and I, then I sent them, emailed them, or uh, um, uploaded the uh, uh, PDFs to them, final print PDFs, and then they printed – you know, um, the, the uh, they had a print run, you know, like a few thousand copies that, and then they, you know, printed them in Singapore and then just put them on a boat and mailed them to me or, you know, shipped them to me. Uh, and then I got, then I had to find, go through the, the whole thing of getting distribution, which is a whole business a racket that is just as complex as writing a book in the first place and not nearly as fun or as entertaining. <laughs> uh, but I sent it out to Barnes & Noble. Barnes & Noble liked it. They wanted to put it in their store, so I had to get a distributor. So I sell my books to the distributor. Then the distributor gives them to Barnes & Noble or sells them to Barnes & Noble. And then eventually the distributor will give me, you know, pays me for that. So it's a very convoluted business, but I'm selling them online, selling them through Amazon and through Barnes & Noble. And I'm always looking to sell to more stores. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's um, you know, I get more of a money for it. But yeah, this movie, this book wouldn't be, uh, is very kind of an esoteric take on zombies or a very different take on zombies. It's not the standard kind of like yeah. shoot them in the head survivalist approach. I don't know who would be interested in that. And a lot of publishers don't want to print overseas or if they do, they, you know, cause I had to do that. That was the only way I could afford, you know, a color book. Um, cause the book is actually like glossy, you know, full color, uh, pages and everything. So, um, the PDF, you know, it looks the same as the, uh, on the PDF. Um, but yeah, 
It's it's a very unless you unless you you have the graph, several of those skills, the graphic design, and the writing, the editing, then I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, at least for a very illustrated book, you know, like I'm doing. I'm kind of an odd duck, even in the self publishing industry. I think because yeah. uh, of uh, the the books uh, take and all the content. So, yeah. uh, but what do I know? So, so um, you're saying yeah. that you're saying Is you that, can get the book on Barnes and Noble. Um, yeah, website, and you can get it from your site. It's uh, in stores too, in Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Um, you, I know I've I've had people like, hey, I saw it in New York, I saw it in Boston, and um, so they they have it. Uh, I don't know how many different stores they have it in, but they they distribute it nationally, uh, and you can get it on Amazon and my own website. And my own website is you know there's it's two dollars cheaper to, and free shipping. So and that's zombies uh, of the world dot com. Yeah, zombies of the world dot com. Uh, and then there's a store, uh, and you, there's a link to the store. There's also posters. You can, like the original thing was uh, going to be just a species poster listing the 20 different species with all their scientific names uh, and a little description of each one. Um, but yeah, so it blew up. that's kind of what. I, yeah, <laughs> so uh, right now I'm just writing the follow up novel and continuing to learn more about marketing and distribution, which is a Sisyphean task that uh, 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 that is profoundly less entertaining than writing a book. <laughs> so that's pretty fascinating that it started off with an idea of a poster, yeah. morphed into a book. You yeah. you, you grabbed who is now going to be, or I guess somewhat famous within the gaming industry, artist before he became got picked up. Yeah. Um, now you're teaching yourself how to publish and market your book. Um, yeah. When it, you started with the poster idea, did you imagine? All of this would happen? No, it was kind of like <laughs> a side project. I was going to school, uh, finishing up my degree and uh, uh, my master's, and I just wanted to uh, have something to do. Uh, or just, you know, I thought, yeah, I'm, I've, I'm going to school. I might as well come up with some sort of project. I have some, some sort of something, at least, uh, even if I can't, you know, make a lot of money on it, have something like, hey, here's what I do. I it's better than a resume, you know, a portfolio. So, yeah. um, I, posters were cheap to print, and a web series I thought would be a good idea uh, to market it. And then, you know, uh, so that, yeah, that was the start of it. So, yeah, it was just started this side project and kind of took a life of its own, an unlife of its own, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> um, um, I think it's interesting that with that, that I, like, I like the book a lot. And, um, yeah. and I think it's pretty funny that I, I just found out that you were into, into gaming because. My, my first comment, I was like, wow, this kind of reminds me of the Monster Manual. Like, that's, yeah. that's how I yeah. saw it. And it was like, and it was better than the Monster Manual in that it sort of had a story woven in between it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I like that a lot, but that's what it reminded me of, the Monster Manual. Oh, yeah. No, that's uh, definitely the, the D&D manuals uh, were a big influence on me, the Monster Manuals. Um, because uh, when I was growing up, I also I had, a, you know, had those, you know, the, the Monster Manuals, which are really fascinating because they only, not only tell you, like, here's this monster, you know, it's a chimera. And it not only tells you how many hit points it has, how much damage it can do, uh, but it also tells you, here's its ecology, here's right. its habitat, yeah, so you know, like, here's it, its it personality. Here, it eats and, this. like, what it does outside of combat, you know, and... Um, he can be it, found in grassy marshlands. And, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's four to 40 of them that show up, and <laughs> yeah. they have them there with uh, one to 500 pieces of copper and yeah, a 30% yeah. chance of a piece of artwork. We don't know how Chimera's got <laughs> artwork, but they do. So um, they... Uh, so that that was, and then there was another thing. I was also like, you know, animals, and uh, so I had all these, you know, Ottoman field guides to like, you know, reptiles or amphibians or, you know, uh, various animals, and those are pretty interesting too. If you, especially if you, you know, like you find out, oh, this type of animal, you know, nests in this kind of area and does this kind of crazy thing to ward off predators, and uh, so I kind of took the. So those those are some of my favorite reading, and then yeah, I, I I've stayed with role playing. Uh, I'm a freelance writer for Arc Dream um, and some other places, and I have my own podcast, Role Playing Public Radio, and Role Playing Public Radio Actual Play, where we just record our game sessions uh, and post them online, and people find them entertaining for some reason. And I took those together and sort of, you know, the the, the monster manuals and feel like, well, okay, we'll do that, and you know, Audubon Field Guide to Zombies, basically, and in that, but it would wouldn't just be like the twenty. Species, because that's not enough for a book. I mean, I'd have to have, you know, uh, I came up with 20 species of zombie, but coming up with like 40 or 60 would be a little much. Um, 
the the so I sort of added onto it by adding history of zombies, explaining why they're considered a species, why they're considered you know a family, uh, and then you know the history. How does humanity re- interact with zombies? And scientific research. How are people researching zombies? What are they trying to figure out about zombies? How are they trying to use zombies for you know the benefit of mankind, and that kind of thing. And so yeah, I kept, I kept adding on because I have to like uh, you know exercise in world building and trying to tell the story of like this is what a world with zombies would be like is is basically what I'm saying is you know things would be really different in, in some ways but in most ways it'd be kind of similar and it wouldn't be post apocalyptic because I think we would adapt to them. I mean, of course, the one section I do have you know zombie survival tips and I say the biggest threat in a zombie attack you know aren't the zombies. It's the people. The people yeah, are really yeah. uh, the thing you have to be aware of. And that's also supported by the canon. I mean, you watch any Romero film, it's always the people that screw everything up. Yeah. Zombies, yeah, they're kind of difficult. But yeah, the people, that's, 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 where, that's who's going to get you killed. Yeah, I do like the section in the book where it says who to trust and who not to trust. Yeah, yeah, that was funny. <laughs> yeah, teenagers and, gun- <laughs> and survivalists. Um, and unstable, yeah. So in... Uh, it, because yeah, I mean they'd get you killed. I mean it's just you know zombies are predict are mostly predictable. I mean the Return of the Living Dead zombies, the talking zombies, which can you know uh, think and have <laughs> used tools. Cards. Those are be really dangerous. But like you know most zombies are you know kind of like you know fire or flood. They're just a natural disaster, and they, you you can predict how they're going to behave. So uh, as long as you have some resources, you can kind of deal with them. But people, who the hell knows what they're going to do next? <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah. I thought the um that the sort of aftermath was um is one of the the more fun ideas to explore like how do you pick up the pieces or what would happen if if mankind mm-hmm. was picking up the I like asking those what if questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, those are, that's uh, fun to think about. Like, what are you gonna do? And, and like, did you see um? I guess you've seen um. Like, uh, what was the Fido? The movie Fido. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple, Where, yeah. Like, the zombies are doing test. domestic chores. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's you know there are domesticated zombies in there, and it's not just uh, Fido. You have in Day Day of the Dead too. They you know Chuck, you know the, yeah. the one zombie they try and tame. So uh, yeah, people would try to make use of what they have, and, and they have zombies. Why don't we use them? Right. I mean, Un- we d- domesticated other animals. Why can't we? You know, that probably wanted to eat us at one point. Uh, so why couldn't we domesticate you know zombies? Um, so yeah, they, and then you have that, that, that <laughs> photos are really great too for the, the production design, I guess, you know, the, the whole 1950s, uh, nuclear, uh, uh you know, atomic, you know, yeah. Pleasantville kind of look, yeah. uh, is pretty, uh, uh, hard to beat. So, um, but yeah, um, I think, yes, yeah, so, so I actually have that in the book too, zombies of the world at the very end, they have like what, you know, uh, one of the things I really love in like popular mechanics and these other magazines, what the future would look like, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like, oh yes, we'll have flying cars and flying cars will have tail fins and they'll look like this. And you know, the, these sort of picture perfect families going about with their awesome new technology, you know, nuclear powered jetpacks, you know, for everyone. Yeah. And so I kind of had a, a one artist uh, um, create some what the future with zombie, you know, improvements in zombie technology would look like. And so it's like, oh, you come home, the pets have been zombified so because they were hit by cars, but they're OK now. And there's a, <laughs> a, a zombie servant that's serving dad drinks on the on the front porch and grandpa's partially zombified, but the kids aren't don't mind. And, you know, it's so and there's everything's the skies are blue because everything's powered by zombie technology or zombie <laughs> power. And so there's no pollution. There's no fossil fuels necessary. So, um, yeah, that's the kind of thing. Like, I love that kind of art, too. I mean, that kind of or that kind of outlook. Yeah. Like, everything's going to be peachy and uh, keen uh, uh, just after everything is horrible for a while. So um, those kind of really optimistic things, like after fallout shelters and things like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that uh, I, I I thought that was funny. You know, and, um, and I thought that comes through in the artwork in the book that that sense of humor about it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't take it too. I mean, you can't take zombies too seriously because I mean, you know, they're zombies. Uh, (laughs) I mean, I know they're walking dead makes them an element of drama. Uh, but I mean, again, the walking dead, you could really, with very few changes, make it about, you know, just a normal plague, you know, uh, people getting sick or, you know, even a nuclear attack or some sort of other, you know, massive disaster. Uh, and, and, and and the story would basically work. Um, so, is almost trying, you know. For me, it's like there's just there's 
so many types of zombies and they're they're each a little different and they're they're each kind of terrible and goofy at the same time so you got you got to have fun with it so yeah, yeah. and it sounds well, like I, I mean, it definitely shows that you had fun with it yeah, yeah. well you know what your book is um it settled a lot of fights <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Because, uh, you know, like, there's always that argument, oh, it's 28 days later, they're not zombies, no, you know, and or or white zombie, they weren't really dead, they were just under the control yeah. of the zombie master, and so, you know, so, now I'm like, well, let's check the zombies of the world book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the voodoo zombie I, I describe is like, that's the one zombie that can come, become a human again, all the other ones, it's permanent, and then, yeah, the 28 days, they're, they're the zombies that are incomplete, they're, they're very infectious, but they starve to death. Uh, so, yeah, I kind of, uh, uh, the only thing that I didn't do that um, is the, just the, the fast zombie versus slow zombie thing, because I, I do think if there were fast, mindless zombies that were just utterly fearless, you know, could run forever at, you know, marathon speeds, we'd all be doomed because they're just <laughs> – because like the Dawn of the Dead remake, I mean, I love – it's a That's great a movie. movie. It's a great zombie film. Don't get me wrong. It's just like – there's no like in a sense no suspense for me it's because yeah they're doomed there's a, like a hundred thousand <laughs> zombies outside the mall they can all outrun them they can almost outrun cars and you know they they have absolutely no chance at least with the the Romero zombies the the, the classic shambling zombies you yeah. uh you have a chance you know uh if you're you're cautious and you're paranoid but like with these new ones like yeah you're dead everyone's dead i mean it, it just game over it's it's uh it, like in a role playing situation it's like uh i'm going to throw a you know an adult red dragon at your level 1 characters you're dead yeah you're dead <laughs> uh or a lich you know it's like there's no contest so um. Yeah, it, 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 the the fast zombies that didn't really do anything for me, uh, in narratively, and I couldn't really see them in a world where humans, you know, actually exist. There wouldn't be a zombies of the world guide in that world because there wouldn't be people to write it. Yeah. So. But I do like how you get into like the the social element of it. It's like especially with like the the Voorhees st style zombie, uh, where they, yeah. they have a social yeah. conscious, and you know people are looking into why these carry on and why they come back to seek yeah. revenge. I mean, the more you think about it, the zombies really are about so, a sort of obsession or an addiction. Um, every type of undead creature out there is, is driven by some purpose uh, that, you know, a lot of it is, you know, even the Romero zombies are driven by a purpose and that purpose is to feed. It's our, you know, most basic instinct to get food, to survive uh, somehow and to kill and consume. And, but, uh, uh, you know, the revenants, uh, Jason Voorhees, revenge, you know, uh, something that can drive someone mad and, you know, push them beyond the grave. Um, and, you know, most of these undead creatures are, you know, it, it, the way that's how they're depicted in, in is they're, they're driven, they're focused, they're, they're utterly obsessed with something. That, that's why they're a monster. Um, and, yeah, the revenants are very, like there's a whole, you know, all the slashers from you know, like 80s films and other things, the ones that are, you know, indestructible and can't be stopped um, are always entertaining uh, to read, you know. But, yeah, they're not human. I mean, they have to be undead. I mean, if you yeah. shoot somebody, you know, five times in the chest, he's going to fall over unless he's, you know, not breathing. So, uh, yeah. You know, I, I thought that um, I thought that you're, you know, the story in the book, um, you know, about like like what's what's powering the zombies and sort of rash you know, that the world yeah, building yeah. that you did. I, yeah. I think you did a really good job in that. And, and I, I was, I was reminded you mentioned the walking dead mm -hmm. and, uh, and I thought that, that the, the walking dead is a great show, but I thought the episode towards the end of the first season, and I'm sure you've seen it where they're trying yeah, to yeah. sort of explain away the zombie phenomena. Yeah. Where they're in the CDC bunker. Yeah. I, I thought that was too much. Like, I think it does, you know, like when you, when you explain it down, like, you know, where they have like detailed cellular drawings and diagrams and, the, you know, they're mm -hmm. really getting down to the nitty gritty science. I think it explained away too much. And, and I'm, I, I think that was a wrong move for the series. I, I mean, I could see that argument. I, I like the episode. Um, Mostly because of the characterization of the scientist. I thought that the scientist, you know, uh, was a great tragic figure. Um, you know, alone trying to solve the the problem alone in this bunker. Uh, but um, I think that's that's kind of like the difference between like a comic book and a novel, and or a movie. You know, genre movie versus a mainstream television show. I think you know they just you know most of the people walk the Watching Dead aren't you know dedicated zombie fans, and they kind of want some sort of justification to 
explain like, well, why don't that? Why doesn't the army show up? Why doesn't these people? Why don't these people show up? Why don't you know? Why? 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 So they they I think it wasn't even explaining the zombie menace in a sense as to point out, yeah, the rest of the world is fucked. You're not gonna, no one's gonna show up and save you. You know, we're definitively answering this, so stop speculating. Well, but that's uh, what I like in your book, though, is like the scientists yeah. are like, we're working on it. You know, like, yeah. Yeah, we're working on trying to figure out why zombies work. And like um, the term I use for it is called Omega Anima, you know, the yeah. end animating force or the end spirit or the end. And, you know, because Latin sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. By the way, I like all the Latin names for the zombies, too. That, that yeah. Was, the scientific cool. names. I kind of used the. I didn't go strict. Uh, I didn't use the strict uh, naming convention. I kind of went more the Wiley Coyote Road. That's what it reminded me <laughs> of. cartoon, kind of standard uh, scientific naming. Like if it sounded good, I uh, I used it. Um, like some of the names are you know based on uh, are from people like you know the Revenant is in on Voorhees you know Voorheesy because that's right. obvious you know. Uh, but in like one of them took me up forever to figure out. And that was the Dancing Zombies name. I didn't want to just call it you know name it after Michael Jackson. Um, so I had to look and look, and I couldn't find a term that would suit it. But then I found an online Latin dictionary that somebody had made up a bunch of words in Latin to describe modern concepts like computer and internet. And he did choreography, like dance choreography. So I, I look at, hey, choreographicus, that's great. <laughs> and there you go. <laughs> and so I used that, and it worked very well. Um, but going back to the original thing, the, the Omega Anima is kind of also like I love how in science, especially in science fiction in general, that you know science scientists will come out with some term to you, especially to describe something they don't quite understand yet or something that's very new, like dark matter. Like dark matter, like mm, looks like there's stuff that we don't understand what it is yet. It's out there in space, and we're not sure what it is yet, but we know it's there uh, because of you know this scientific proof or whatever. And so we're going to call it dark matter. And then you find science fiction writers like, oh, man, that's cool. So what – you know, that's the newest MacGuffin in my sci-fi yeah, space yeah. opera novel, you know. And so the, my, my, the Omega anima, anima is like dark matter in that sense. Is, is, it's, the, it's the like we don't know what the hell this is yet. So well, we're I, just going to uh, call it this and like, you know, that's the, the X in the equation that we, you know, solve for X kind of thing. Um, so that, so I'm being lazy cause I don't try to figure out how they break the laws of physics. Um, I just say we don't know what it is. So that's where we're at. And but I think that's a good thing. Oh, well, I, I think, I think you're at that perfect level of explanation. Uh, the Omega anima is perfect. And I'll, and I'll give you the, the best example ever is when Obi-Wan Kenobi says the force <laughs> is an energy field that binds us and surrounds us and binds the galaxy together. I don't need more than that. When they said it's midi chlorians, they yeah, lost Yeah, right. Me. Yeah. That that is a little too much. I guess it's mic microscopic macro uh, bacteria. Um, they they because, went one step too far. Yeah, because actually I remember um, there's a web comment called uh, Darth and Droids um, or something like that, and it's about like people going through the Star Wars prequel movies, but they're acting like D and D characters. And it's like somebody's running a space fantasy game, and he's like, "Oh, they just use screenshots from the movies and just put new captions in for the characters." And at one point, the character's like, "Wait, midichlorians power my special magic powers, right? My force abilities?" Like, "Yes." Okay, well, here's what we're gonna do. we're gonna give the, take this kid. Anakin, I'm going to give him a blood transfusion. So I'm going to, he'll get my midichlorians and then he'll have the magic force powers too. Like, what? Why can't you do that? Well, why wouldn't I be able to? If they're, they're bacteria in, my, in me, right. then they should be able to transfuse him. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, yeah, if there are midichlorians, wouldn't blood transfusions, you know, wouldn't it be an infectious disease? What wouldn't, instead of magic powers, wouldn't it be, you know, contagious to a certain extent? Um, so damn you science. Yeah, yeah exactly. It kind of, you, you got science in my fantasy. You got fantasy <laughs> in my science. But that, I think that's what separates your book apart from most, you know, zombie guides and other just zombie books is because it, 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 it tries to balance the unanswered answered questions, but it still leaves that imagination in, in there. Yeah. Well, like yeah, I, I mean, said, I'm, like never gonna, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna write midichlorians or whatever. I'm yeah. never gonna have like a definitive answer because I don't think I'll ever be smart enough to come up with something that would like, ah, here's how zombies really. Work. But if even if you were smart enough to come up with that answer, I don't think it would do the genre good. You know, it, w it wouldn't right. benefit the genre for us to have a, a you know a solid answer for it. Right. Um, or I mean, if there is an answer, it would be like, 
in uh like in lovecraftian fiction where there's yeah. like there's a the, there's things that you know the the what we perceive as magic that the aliens are using in cthulhu and his cults is really an alien science so far beyond our understanding that it's basically magic to us and so you know it's the alien hyper science or something like that we will never understand it you know yeah. our brains are too puny uh to <laughs> uh understand it so i think the zombies would be the same way so yeah. um it's been yeah. for centuries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I think um, yeah, zombies are just a, a great stand-in for uh, uh, any type of genre, type of story. Like you know, you have the serious drama things like The Walking Dead, but you also have like zombies as comic characters. I mean, like I, I think I, I think it's great that some of the better romance comedies of the last couple of years have been Shaun of the Dead and Zombieland. And they're, they're, they're romantic comedies. I mean, they're about a guy trying to get a girl. And so like, ha- <laughs> you know, like, Oh yeah, well, it's a zombie movie. It's a romantic comedy. It's both. Yeah. And they're yeah. both <laughs> great. Uh, and, and they're and done really the great, well. Great zombie movies are, can you, stories can be about anything, you know, like it's just a plot element now. So yeah. They're not just exploitation things. It's um, like set in the universe of zombies. Anything can happen. <laughs> exactly. Uh, one of the movies I really want to see, I've seen a trailer for, is called The Dead. And it's an, a, a zombie movie sh- set in Africa, shot in Africa. And it looks like it's about like a, an American and an African soldier uh, trying to get through the, the, you know, the desert or the wilderness, you know, the, of um, – you know, uh, in like Tanzania or someplace, but it's like, you know, the remote outback in, in Africa and there are zombies and they're slow zombies. But like, you know, that place could kill you even without zombies. <laughs> just adding zombies to it isn't really going to do you guys any favor. I mean, that, that's just making it worse. And so that looks like a really good idea for a, a movie is like, oh, yeah, let's let's put them in a really dangerous environment and add zombies to it. And then they're they're from different cultures. Well, they even trust one another. Um, and that, that's just like, wow, that's a really good idea. Uh, I can't wait to see that. Uh, hopefully it'll come (laughs) out on DVD. So, um, but, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think, um, uh, zombies in general, like sort of, um, oh, you mentioned the zombie survival guides earlier. And that was one thing I, one of the inspirations for writing the book was to be the, the diametric opposite of all the other zombie guides. And I actually have written about, like studied, done some research about, um, zombies and survivalism. Do you guys know about survivalism? Uh, I've heard about that the, from the eighties and, you yeah, know, I've Red heard, Dawn and all that. Yeah, I've yeah. seen survivor, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> survivor, man. Um, well, sur- survivalism was really like in the, especially in the eighties during the cold war, uh, people thought that if they got, you know, a bunch of guns and some frozen food, some rations or whatever, and a cabin out in the woods, they could survive if the, the, you know, the Ruskies invaded or if, you know, the bombs dropped and the, 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 just the idea that, Oh, if I have these consumer goods, I can survive anything is kind of like, you can kind of see the same thing in zombie genre fans because they're like, Oh, if I had the right, you know, baseball bat with nails in it, I could survive a zombie apocalypse, you know? So you have the idea of like the zo- zombie survival guy. What do you, what are you going to get for uh, zombie? you know, when zombies attack, I'm sure you guys have had your own discussions. Like what would you do when the zombies attack? Uh, if there were, where would you go? Who would you get to help you? And that kind I of love thing. that conversation. Well, I can tell you for, <laughs> for a fact, I grew up in Texas and I lived yeah. way out in the country. My parents owned a farm and down the road, cause we were at, away from any civilization we had two militia groups come out and train all the time so we'd we would always go down there and, and there's some some of them would even wear ninja outfits and practice and so, <laughs> it was so crazy but they they had awesome guns and they would shoot and stuff, so. yeah if, what, if we have like actually black written ninja it down, outfits they had all different colors black you know black white uh, all different types like that's not in in the texas desert that's not really going to be really good camouflage <laughs> Like blacks are really bad color to wear in Texas, anyways. I would imagine because just you know the heat. I mean, wow. Um, <laughs> but we also had the you know the hardcore military. They have to be stealthy. But, but it was, yeah, it was they, just fun because you could drive by and you'd see all these ninjas, and they, and you would like have a group of ninjas, and then you'd have a group of military guys, and you these are grown men. These are not <laughs> kids playing out in the field, and then, you know they would have their AK forty sevens, their M sixteens, and they would be out there doing their drills, and it was kind of awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Just <laughs> So wow. that's where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, and that's certainly <laughs> fun, and that's kind of like the same thing. Zombie, the zombie survival, the zombie genre kind of made like after the Cold War, there, survivalism never like like well, there's kind of a little bit of resurgence, you know, during the Clinton administration. Of like, oh, New World Order, they're gonna take your guns, <laughs> yeah. and then that kind of fell through. And then there's Y2K, but after Y2K, you know, nobody would take survivalism seriously, you know, or you know, nobody. And but then the zombie genre sort of popped up and kind of like is a surrogate kind of thing where you can say I'm preparing for the zombie apocalypse without being made you know like thought of as insane you're like oh that's just a hobby you know that's fun because you even have like groups like the zombie squad uh, yeah. where they use the zombie I- invasion as a metaphor for civil disaster preparedness okay. uh, you know, and you also for- have the zombie research society which is a real group that get together of professors and they um, their website is zombie research society dot Org, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, we, there's we a ton of these before. these places, and the idea is like, I can survive anything, you know, or like, oh, uh, and then it's more of a fun thing. But yeah. uh, the, the, the zombie apocalypse is also really convenient. I, I've noticed that, like, you can have a zombie apocalypse and nobody gets killed. Like, everyone gets killed, but all their stuff is still there. You know, so you if you survive, you can take all their stuff, you know, because they're all zombies or they've all been eaten. So, like, you get all – it's, a, you know, a consumer paradise because you, you, you can go to the shopping mall and you get everything. I mean, like, you know, the Dead Rising video games are explicitly about that. Yeah. Like, there's thousands and thousands of zombies, but you can go to all the stores and take <laughs> all the things, you know. And, and it's, it's a fun pr- game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, they're, they're fun games. I've played them both uh, – beaten them both of them, but – um, it, 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 it's just an interesting dynamic to see that that's kind of like a, one part of the appeal yeah. is this idea of like, ah, I'm going to survive this apocalypse and it'll be great and badass and fun and not like utterly, you know, depressing and horrifying. You know, it's going to be more, you know, dead rising and not walking dead. So, yeah. um, kind of a slight difference. Man, well, um, did you see that the, um, we we mentioned it before on the show. The CDC wrote a um, the disaster preparedness guide, and it yeah, was they in did. the they, context they, of a zombie uh, apocalypse. Yeah, they they've done a couple of things. But they also like. Um, are you talking to the graphic novel, or they've done? I think two different things. Yeah, they uh, did. A, two separate both. guides. One was a graphic novel. The second one was a graphic novel, and then there was a simpler guide, but produced before that. But yeah, even the government agencies. I think even like uh, like the Missouri Department of Conservation. Uh, I live in Missouri, and they put out something about like, oh, zombies. Uh, don't hunters don't shoot zombies. You know, uh, on Halloween or like during October, and you know uh, the Kansas uh, State Emergency Organization uh, Agency has done the same thing. Um, so yeah, it's very easy to like. Uh, uh, very appeal. Zombies are very popular right now, so people really like the idea of like using that. Uh, it, it, it's less depressing it's it's more funny than it is depressing you know like real disasters are depressing like you know uh, hurricanes and typhoons and earthquakes and yeah those are kind of just you know depressing yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's like they tricked people into learning something exactly yeah like oh maybe you should get some five gallons of water and an emergency radio hmm? yeah <laughs> that wouldn't be bad would it uh and maybe you should stop running outside during a tornado um uh, <laughs> Where uh, one of my friends was, uh, um, told me recently he was a resident assistant at a university and he would have to do things like stop people from running outside during her, uh, tornadoes. Because, uh, again, it was in Missouri, you know, Tornado Alley, and you're just like, oh, my God, people are so stupid. And, uh, you don't need yeah. a tornado to say that comment. <laughs> yeah, this is true, but, like, this is a very egregious example of it, like running outside during a tornado. Really? You can see the tornado. It's on the horizon. <laughs> you should not be out there standing in the middle of a field. Um, it's not- maybe, maybe they should be. Maybe that's natural selection. <laughs> we lived in uh, Norfolk, the Norfolk, Virginia Beach area where we had the guy – famously streak behind the newscaster oh, yeah. during the hurricane. <laughs> well, to be fair, the newscaster's there too. So like, you <laughs> yeah. know, and there were, the, I think I've seen that same footage and there's like cars driving there. So like, yeah, yeah there's a hurricane, but it's kind of like, not like the same thing as like, there's a tornado bearing down right on you. Well, and the, you're running the stores were empties, but the bars were full. That was the, yeah, the, yeah. the story. Yeah. 
Yeah, possibly. That's um, the extent of my hurricane preparedness. <laughs> it's just, yeah, illogical and crazy behavior. I mean, although I think in role-playing games it gets even worse. People get even dumber. I don't know if you guys have how much gaming experience you have. but We're actually starting uh, a D&D podcast in the next couple of weeks. Oh, great. Um, send me a link and I'll, I'll, I'll put a link to it on RPPR. Oh, um, right on. The uh, yeah, that's the other thing I do is role playing public radio, um, and it's a real. Uh, uh, it's been a very interesting experience, you know, uh, uh, podcasting about it. And I started doing it like a, a sort of typical advice show, and then two years ago I started doing an actual play podcast where we just record the game sessions, and that's now even more popular than the main podcast itself. <laughs> Um, partially because I can put out one episode a week with that because I just record the game sessions, then post them. I don't have to, yeah. you know, produce a whole show. I'm sure you guys know how, like, the time consuming actually, you know, oh, editing. Believe and- me, I have what five shows, about to have yeah. seven. So. Yeah, I, I like. You know, it's funny. Um, the 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 idea of the actual play podcast it never even crossed my mind until somebody pointed me to um, uh, Critical Hit, mm-hmm. and um. I can't believe how compelling it is. Like I just yeah. like listening to these guys play the game. It makes me want to go play the game. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Critical Hits is you know really popular comic book uh, website, and like I don't know if it's them or the I mean I don't know the the stats, but it's either them or the D or the Penny Arcade D and D podcast is pro- easily the most popular one. Yeah. Like if you go on iTunes, like they like they both the the, the critical hits a- actual play podcast has like you know nine hundred reviews or something like that, all five stars, and you know that that they're just other podcasts will have like ten. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think our PBR is like eighty or something like that, uh, fifty or eighty. Um, well, there's two podcasts, but anyways, yeah, no, the, it's really weird. I like I did it just because it was easy content to produce. Like it was like I'll just record, and then yeah. I got a, a Zoom H2, which is this digital field recorder with yeah. a 360 degree uh, listening or recording uh, range, so you can just put it in the center of the table, pick up everyone's voice, mm-hmm. and I put it down there and recorded for a game. Then like you know, uploaded the MP3 and. People started listening to it yeah, and they started too. commenting on it, and it kind of grew from there. So, um, yeah, I, I was I was looking into your into your podcast. Are, are you strictly Dungeons and Dragons Fourth Edition or prior editions? You guys do other stuff too, right? Yeah, no. Um, like we started, I started putting the actual plays on the the main side, the RPPR, uh, and there's like thirty pot, uh, actual plays there. Then there's now actual play dot roleplayingpublicradio dot com, and that. Um, is that we we we're actually we're not we haven't been playing D in a long time actually we haven't played D and D since for like a year now. Uh, we've been we we completed a fourth ed D and D campaign called the New World Campaign. It was forty five episodes long, um, and we did several Kickstarter ransom projects for it. So you can actually get there's four PDFs you can download that describe the campaign setting, so you can run your own New World campaign. Uh, but now we're doing two campaigns. One is set in Wild Talents, or is a Wild Talents based game, which is a superhero RPG. Uh, and so we're doing a, a kind of a Marvel s ish universe where it's kind of like Spider Man in terms of level power level, kind of like street level, but not like ridiculously, you know, super low power. And, you know, the characters are a ragtag band of heroes trying to protect the city from bad guys. And then <laughs> the other campaign is Eclipse Phase, which I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, have you heard of it? Or no, no, I have not. That's, that's new to me. It's a transhuman sci-fi horror game uh, set in the future about 100 years. Well, it, it, they don't give a specific date. But basically transhuman means the idea of like using technology to transcend human limitations. Uh, so the idea is in Eclipse Phase, it's assumed that every, almost everyone, not, uh, the, the humans that are left, all have what they call a cortical stack, which is a little diamond armored uh, hard drive at the base of your skull. It's about the size of a grape. And it backs up your brain continually so if you die your your cortical stack will be left behind they can take that cortical stack and then upload the copy the data download the data and then put you in a new body um and you can also transmit your mind to like from venus to mars for example at the speed of light obviously because you're just transmitting a signal basically and then be uploaded into a new body or you can make copies of your mind so there's like really and then there's fabricators that instantly make whatever you have the blueprints for um and 
That sounds but awesome. But <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a horror game because basically, in Eclipse Face, 10 years ago, before the game is, actually starts, um, a group of AIs called the Titans basically went crazy and wiped out 95% of humanity and made Earth a hellhole. And so the 5% that are left are in everywhere in the solar system but you know earth and so you're you're a group of uh, uh you work for this organization called firewall trying to protect whatever the ai's left and then the ai's disappeared so you're trying to you're you're working for this organization called firewall you're basically the men in black going around stopping any other threats to humanity that might you know wipe them out or damage them and so if you like charles stross or um you know the the sci-fi novel or altered carbon I think Richard and Morgan wrote that, um, or that kind of sci-fi. It's it's hard sci-fi. Like there's no faster than light, like spaceships, or there's so there's nothing like Star Trek or Star Wars. Um, there is some alien technology, but you know it's really alien and really weird, yeah. and all the human technology is based on you know possible science. Uh, so it, that's what we've been playing. Those are the two campaigns we've been playing in RPPR. And they've been getting a lot of really good feedback. People really like it. Like our players in the, the Eclipse Space campaign, like there's an uplifted octopus and then, who's a socialite who goes around. Smooth, he's, he's the face man, the one who makes all the diplomacy checks. Uh, and then <laughs> there's a con artist from the moon, a uh, soldier from Earth who uh, wants to go back to Earth and reclaim it. Uh, and then I'm playing a crazy psychic person. Uh, who's convinced the Red Queen has kidnapped his sister, and he's only seven years old. He was just raised in a time-accelerated virtual reality, so he's he's like physically like or mentally eighteen or twenty in his early twenties, but he's physically seven years old. So uh, and he's running around shooting people. So uh, it, it, a good time. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. So th- those are the two main campaigns. We also do a lot of like Call of Cthulhu. Uh, we did do some Dark Sun for D and D and. Um, I've just been really impressed with like the, the, the kind of feedback or like response it's gotten. Like people just really like, I go to work, I have, you know, a long job and, or I have a long commute and I listen to these people. It makes me laugh (laughs) and I am in Australia or I'm in Sweden and, you know, and like, wow, it's just like one person like posted on it's like i listen to your horror games like a call of cthulhu games while i'm sailing at night between the catalina islands and like, <laughs> like like oh, okay. oh that's you know like uh, i just i had no words i didn't realize people did that and it's just really crazy to me it's always cool to hear how people you know respond to it you know you never know who you're going to reach out to yeah. so um, so i think this is a good time for you to plug the website for that uh, yeah, uh, the role playing public radio is slangdesign.com slash RPPR. Uh, and then actual RPPR uh, actual play is actualplay.roleplayingpublicradio.com. Uh, if you just Google RPPR uh, or RPPR actual play, you should pull it up. Um, and if you if you miss the links, I'll put them up in the show notes as well. Yeah. And then, of course, zombies of the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can keep talking forever uh, yeah, about yeah. this stuff. If you want to go over individual species or uh, uh, game systems, I'd be happy to. But I don't know. how. Do you guys have a time limit or something? No, we, yeah, we're a two hour show. So we have all night. <laughs> oh, OK. Nice. But uh, um, yeah, I was sent a I did a review like maybe a year and a half ago. Of a role playing game, I sent it to you. Yeah. Um, zombie c- catalysm. Yep. And, catalysm. Yeah. And it looks really interesting. It's about you know the zombie apocalypse and um is set and set in that realm. Are you familiar with that? Zombie cataclysm. Yeah. Uh, who published that? Um, I don't have it in front of me. It was a while back that I did the review for it. And I don't hmm. have it. it, it I've was, heard it was, of. It, there's two. There's you know of course the big one is all flesh must be eaten. Um and that I've I've played and I've run a few games of that, um and that's kind of a universal zombie game where you can engineer different types of zombies like zombies that are only damaged if you destroy their spines you know instead of their brains. This was a um, I, 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 yeah I don't know who published it but um I I thought I think it was like a D six combat system and uh yeah I have it here and um, but the interesting thing about it was. The character generation was mm-hmm. wasn't you don't the character that you play in the game isn't like you know I'm gonna be you know the guy with the chainsaw stuck to his hand like the the character generation was like how much do you weigh and mm-hmm. what you know how far did you go to school and have you had any gun training so it takes all of your real life experience. And then, like, somehow, like, massages that into a pen and paper RPG tabletop character. 
And then, like, the the maps that you're supposed to use, it's like, get a street map from your hometown. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, the Zombie Invasion Simulation Game is the, the title of it. Um, and we haven't played it yet. Uh, we've talked huh. about it since we've done the well, review. Well, there's another game that has a similar, it's called uh, Outbreak Undead. Uh, I saw it at Gen Con. Uh, last year, and, or in this year too, um, and it it uses a similar thing. Like they have a quiz at the beginning for character generation, where you can say, "How much do you lift? You know, how much? What is your IQ? What is your education?" And blah 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 blah, and you can generate your stats from that. So that's like, and I've done, I, I've actually run the same type of game in All Flesh Must Be Eaten, where like I ran a game where everyone played themselves and statted themselves out. And we did a zombie attack game uh, or zombie survival game set in with the town we were all in. Yeah. Um, and that, that, it's a very fun thing to do. Although I found out the one thing you have to do is kind of like you don't want to be like cruel to your players. And like, no, your IQ is five. It's not, <laughs> you know, like your, your intelligence score is five. You know, your strength is two, you know. But on the other hand, you don't want to let them get away with anything because I had one player who was a theology major and had like gone to the gun range twice you know or you know a very yeah. not no military no police no family connections to firearms or that kind of thing but he gave himself a max score in firearms and <laughs> like, like olympic level <laughs> sniper is Come what he on. was saying he was it's like yeah no i i, I was just uh, <laughs> i think i he, he he was the one he lost a leg by the end of the game and yeah Fun so, times. So you, you I, I take it you, you would be a fan of playing pretty much yourself and not not being the hard line that no it has to be role playing you have to play a character that's not you know. Oh no no I I think um, I mean for a zombie game set in your own town I mean that's 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 just such a great uh, fun thing to do at least once you know yeah. Uh, that uh, yeah I'd let everybody do that but uh, you know for role playing in general I just tend to be pretty I, I try to encourage it of course but like. Um, I mean, if you listen to podcasts, I'm not like, you know, you can't do this. All right. Uh, you know, I, I try never to say no. I say yes, but you'll have to do this in order to do whatever, you know, stupid thing you want to pull off. And yeah. players want to do stupid things all the time. So are you, because, you're, the, you're the DM, not the player. Yeah. Usually I'm the, I'm running the game. Uh, although in the Eclipse phase game, I'm the player because uh, okay. one of the other people in our group has uh, volunteered to run it. And that's been uh, a, a welcome change of pace. Um but uh, usually I'm running this. But so I haven't actually played in any zombie survival games as myself. So I don't know how that would work out. Uh, so I've run it. So, I, yeah, uh, I, I don't know what I would do. So, yeah. Have you guys run those t- sort of games yet? Or, we uh, haven't. I, you... No, I, I sat down and I, I sort of like muddled through the character generation. And, and um, you know, you try not to be like you said, unkind to yourself. But I was like, I looked at my character and I was like, ah, I'd die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of depends. Yeah, I mean, it would be very Darwinian. Uh, and it's kind of, eh, what are you going to do? Um, have, you, have you done the, um, I guess, kind of like conference call type pen and paper role-playing game scenarios that they're doing on um, Yeah, I've run games over Skype. Yeah. Uh, I haven't played in any games over Skype, but I have run games over Skype um, because I uh, one of the things we do in the podcast are these ransoms where the idea is, like, I'll release a game or a PDF for free if everyone pays into this Kickstarter a certain amount of money. Yeah. And so people do that, and then I get the money, and then um, I released the PDF. I've done it four times so far. Um, has it been fairly successful for you? It has been. I just I just finished one a month ago called uh, for uh, an, a standalone game that I'm going to call Kill Explosion. It's going to be a player versus player oriented, you know, action RPG. Uh, and the idea is the players have to kill one another instead of you know trying to help one another. Ah, that's boring. You know, we we should you know <laughs> get right what the players really want to do and just murder each other and. As part of that, like people who contributed a certain amount would get to get. I ran games online for in, in various um, systems, uh, so that's in fact tomorrow night I'm doing one for people who are contributing to the game running a horror game. So um, it's 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 a different experience. Have you guys tried it? It's it's no, I have not. It's 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 harder than at least for me than running a game in face to face because um, you know first you have the difficulty of the dice rolling stuff. Which is kind of like you have to find an online dice roller, or you have to roll the dice yourself, or come to some sort of agreement. And then you don't see their face. I mean, I haven't tried a video conference one yet. Um, 
but I have, uh, uh, so I don't see their faces. So I have to kind of like figure out. And then there's always the awkwardness when you have like six players and yourself and just keeping track of everyone. Yeah. And then, you know, not trying to talk over everyone at once, you know, is pretty, uh, can be kind of challenging. So, uh, but on the other hand, you get to play with people you wouldn't normally have a chance to play with. So you're going to play with someone in England and then other people in America at the same time. Yeah. So oh, it's, living it's, in the it, future, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We live in the future. So that that's pretty entertaining. Um, so I, I would never be able to do that as like the DM because I, I don't know. I just have this this sense that all players are lying to me all the time. Well, yeah, but I mean, as <laughs> they're a DM, like, that's why oh, you, natural 20. No, you didn't. <laughs> Well, that's the idea is that you, you either roll the dice yourself or there are online dice rollers. They're meant for, usually for player uh, play-by-post games, um, but there are ones. Um, I think there's one like invisiblecastle.com. Uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember the name. There's one I use. It's like a, it's like a weird website address. But like you type in like, I want to roll 3D6 and I'll use this code, code you know zombie or whatever, and you hit it and it will then pop up and show you rolled a a five, a five, and a five. You get a fifteen, and then anyone else who types in the code "zombie" will see all the rolls made for that. Uh, and so they, so there's no way to cheat that because it's all it's all on a server. So um, that's pretty deep. You know, look, I'm saying that it, it, like tongue in cheek because you know yeah, we yeah. always had good players, but you know you know how like players are always trying to get one up on you. Oh yeah, yeah no, <laughs> and you know sometimes players are just lucky. Like I have one player in my group, uh, Tom, who's also the co-host of RPPR, and he just has the damnedest luck when it comes to dice rolling. And, like, it's gotten to the point where people in the actual play, like, commenting on the actual plays, Kapaka's like, Tom, you, you, you played a three hour game of Call of Cthulhu and you've never failed a dice roll. What's up with that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he, and, you know, he, he admitted, you know, sometimes he does fudge the dice rolls for his own results. And he's, he's like, sometimes has a difficulty adding up numbers, like five, <laughs> a three, yeah. and a two. That's, 15 yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, got, I rolled a 15 yeah, and they're, they're not so, being necessarily dishonest but they conveniently forget things or yeah <laughs> although but sometimes you know what? that's half like... the fun of doing the being the dm there. That's, that's that's sort of half the fun of running the game but you you have a reputation of being pretty cruel oh i am man. i'm mean <laughs> man <laughs> i'm harsh yeah i mean that's the thing like you, you have to give them a challenge otherwise it's kind of meaningless i think yeah you know, in Eclipse Phase, there's uh, uh, I was just discussing with people. Uh, we just did an episode on the podcast about Eclipse Phase, and Eclipse Phase is a horror game, uh, but there's still a lot of opportunities for being a munchkin in it because the idea is, um, you know, you, they have a point based system for ge- to generate your character, and you can you can spend your points like on your skills or your aptitudes, which are your attributes that move. No matter what, you, since you can literally switch bodies, you can go from like a bodybuilder to like a super smart, you know more if you can become smarter by switching bodies you know like my brain is better now you know um or have be in an you know animal or a robot body um but the idea is you know players spend their points on all these different things and you can become really powerful right at the gate if you spend a lot of points on gear like i'm loaded up with cybernetics and you know you know wired reflexes and all these reflex boosters and all these you know armor plating for myself and i get you know enhanced senses and all these guns and blah 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 i'm a walking death machine so yeah you can do that but the thing is again at eclipse phase um if you blow up, you're not necessarily dead. They can grab your cortical stack and back you restore you from backup. So you're not like you don't have to make a new character. But if you spend, you know, 50, 20 percent of all your points on gear, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. You just lose it when it blows up or worse yet is like you don't have it's not blown up. But like, oh, we're on Mars right now. Uh, we need to go to the moon. Well, we could take a spaceship, which will take six months. Or we can, you know, upload, transmit our brains to the moon via, you know, via, uh, you know, just a signal, an encrypted signal, so radio signal or whatever, and that will, you know, we can get there and upload into new bodies. But you know, you can't upload your physical body through that, so you, you you'll have to get a new body, whatever is available. So you, again, you just lost twenty percent of all your points because you're, oh, they just had a, a crappy robot body that blows, you know, uh, malfunctions every once in a while, you know, a, a clunker. So good luck with that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, 
And, or, or, and then the other worst thing is forking. The idea is like you can make multiple copies of your mind. Your mind's a digital file. So you can, you know, copy paste it and put it in different bodies. You can have like four of you running around. Uh, and then so like some PCs are like, oh, I'll just control all of them. They're all my characters. I have a team of me. <laughs> and by the rules, anyone you only get to control one character. Everyone else is an NPC. So if you, especially if you're role playing a selfish bastard, you can like, I put my mind in five different bodies and tell them to be my slaves. They're like, fuck you, I don't care. I, you know, <laughs> this, I'm this, I'm just a selfish and much of a bastard. I'm gonna run off and do whatever I want. And uh, it sounds like so, an awesome game. We're gonna have to pick it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's kind of the 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 idea. Uh, there. That uh, yeah, so Munchkins. Not, not that I don't love the <laughs> the the gaming talk, um, because I I could go all night. Um, yeah. But, but uh, with the horror games, like I've tried a couple of the horror tabletop games. Yeah. And um, and they've never really they've never really done it for me, only mm-hmm. because um, I don't know. It's just for most horror games, we all, everybody's kind of like laughing and yucking it up. There's no real horror. There's nothing scary that ever happens. Sure. I mean, horror is really hard to do. It's like, uh, the hardest, I think the hardest type of gaming, uh, to get across because yeah, it, it tends, especially most gamers tend to be really savvy for genre conventions. And, you know, they've read a lot of the books, they've played a lot of the video games, seen a lot of the movies, and so you're not going to get them with the same kind of cheap scare. So you have to – It take, but it can be done. It's just one you have to take it kind of seriously as a GM, I think. You know, you kind of like have to tell people, you know, to, to cut it da- out a little bit, you know, not to, not to be like, yeah, you shall obey my will. But, you know, <laughs> don't like – Stop talking when they, if they're all just you know being jackass and ignoring you, just stop talking. And wait for them to stop. I'm like, okay, fine, we're here to game, you know. And that's uh, where my fog and, machines can come in. We can, <laughs> yeah. See. yeah. And Any then it's not like the, the monsters machine. themselves. It's going to scare them. It's the sort of implications of what the monsters want, or what the what's going on. Um, you know, like they're they're or what they don't know. You know, like I ran a game. Uh, there's one game on the actual play website um there's a few of them the one of them is called candle cove it's based on this creepy pasta story called candle cove which about a, a like hey do you guys uh, which is i won't explain it but it's it's a very creepy short story that you can find on the internet uh it's like 500 words it's like you okay. should just google that and read it uh and then i ran like a two-part game as uh, in the world of darkness using that and, like the first thing uh the, the opening scene i had for the game where the players were all like they had bought a VHS tape of this show, Candle Cove, which is very rare, very expensive. Or they 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 so they pop it in the VCR to watch it because they all remember seeing it before as kids, but they can't remember much about it. And as they start, you know, watching it, then uh, they uh, get a they they. The, this old man appears on the front lawn and wants to wants the tape. He was like, "Let me in," um, and then. Like, go away. So that's a little weird. And then he says, but he doesn't go away. And then he just says, boo. And then all the lights go out. And now all the players, the players, not just the characters, are all freaking out. Like, what the hell is going on? And you know, then they hear a window break. The old man's inside. And so they're all, like, freaked out in character because it's just in and of itself. It's an old man. Oh, the lights are out. But just that that exact combination got them. Uh, other Other things that tend to scare players, especially infections, uh, especially if you can corrupt the characters' bodies. Uh, I was just on another podcast uh, last week, uh, Unspeakable, and one of the guys was talking about a Call of Cthulhu game he played in where the characters all were infested with ticks that were the size of poker chips, and they spent two game sessions just in the hospital trying to get them out. <laughs> <laughs> and like, for, like they didn't even have to make sanity checks in the game because the players were so squicked out by all of this. Yeah. They were like, ah, God, like they restrain you at night and give you sedatives. The sedatives are to keep you from going mad from the pain or from the itching. And then the, the restraints are to keep you from scratching the ticks uh, and making it worse while you're asleep. You know, I'm like, ah, uh, see, so, I, I just I just infected all my players with lycanthropy and, and most of them are like, eh, no big deal. Well, again, <laughs> that's like one thing is telling them that they have lycanthropy. Like you should just be like, yeah, you, you have to surprise them to a certain you have to kind of trick them at, at a certain point. Like it, it just like, you black out. 
And then like, okay, you wake up, you're covered in blood yeah. and <laughs> your clothes are gone. You're naked and you don't know where you are. You're in an alley somewhere. You don't recognize the city. <laughs> then like, you know, that, that's the kind of thing you'd have to do is, you know, really, uh, you can't just like, yeah, you have lycanthropy. Yeah. No, you have to, you have to really like, uh, go beyond the safety, you know, like if players think they're in control, it's they're they're not going to be scared. But once they lose that control, they're going to like, that's, that's going to start, you know, pushing some buttons, I think. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll see how, we'll see how it goes. Cause uh, I don't know. It's, it's fourth edition rules. So there's like stages of lycanthropy. So nobody's yeah. actually like wolfing out yet, but there's some, you know, there's some side effects. It's like fourth ed is really hard to do horror in. Uh, third ed was kind of hard to do horror in too. Uh, D and D is just hard unless you're doing like like the last game I can imagine scaring people in in D and D is like second edition Ravenloft. I was gonna say Ravenloft was the classic one that's and I and I never played that because I was always the the DM and and I just never did it. And yeah. so I would love to play Ravenloft where somebody's doing it right. Yeah, um, you know, because in Ravenloft, anything's scary in that because, like, man, the rules are just like stacked against players. Yeah, like even zombies are scary in that. Like, oh yes, you're cursed now. You can never go back home. And <laughs> oh, if you do, if you think bad thoughts, you'll turn into a monster. You know, like if you do something corrupting, you'll become corrupt. You know, it's like wow. Uh, yeah. yeah. So like, yeah, in Ravenloft, you can scare players too. I mean, because, but in fourth ed and third ed, characters have so much control over themselves. They have so much power. You know, relative. Uh, to the to the setting there that they're it, it's really hard to scare them um i and so yeah the, the the game does matter like call cthulhu you're just like a dude with 10 hit points and 50 percent you know shotgun skill what what can you do against a shoggoth you know or a you know even a zombie um yeah. but uh yeah uh, it, uh, it is an uphill battle for those games so, yeah I, uh, I think i think the you know really that's that's the that's the that's the a level that's the a level gaming right there is the the horror game for the, for yeah. the player and the and the dm yeah i mean you you really yeah i wouldn't try to uh because the, the thing is, especially in fourth ed because the rules are so concrete and mechanical well in third ed too like players will just argue with you if they if you if you try and take you know liberties with the rules like if you make your own version of lycanthropy there's like yeah, oh, you failed one save. Oh, nothing happens. And then, like, the next night, you wake up naked, covered in blood in a different city. You know, like, players will call BS on you because that's not how it's supposed to work. Uh, yeah. And you can't, like, take those kind of liberties with the rules. But on Call of Cthulhu, you can because, eh, it's the mythos. You know, it's Cthulhu. You know, you're going to argue with Cthulhu. He's going he's gonna to change the laws of physics to suit him. You know, screw you. You know, he's, again, Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, yeah. Um, I mean, in, in D and D it would be more to scare them again. It, it's about loss of control a lot of times. So it's something out of their control. Um, like maybe not even hit them themselves, but NPCs that they care about. If they're, yeah. you know, the, the rare type of player character that actually cares about someone other than their, you know, themselves. Like, uh, well, that was the one memorable uh, moment that I had back when I was playing D and D like shortly after high school. Cause I, I, I dropped out of, the D and D world. And it wasn't until recently that, um, we started doing this new podcast that I've started getting interested in it. But my most memorable moment was that I, I had an NPC. We were playing a game that I made a foolish decision d during battle and he died. And it, I don't know what happened, but the, the story was told so good. And I was so, so involved with it. It's just like, it kind of hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean that can happen. Um, I mean that 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 that's that's good. You want that to happen. Yeah. I mean, that, that's kind of like ah, that's the the highlights of gaming. Um, but that that takes a lot of work on the player and the GM and the players. You yeah. know, um, and uh, I know like for me, one of the things that my players will just randomly latch on to specific NPCs that they like, and then will like move heaven and earth to like defend those NPCs. Like in the the New World campaign, where the D and D campaign I ran, like the players in the second session met like the Gripply, which is a fr uh, a, a tribe of frog people, 
And they just, I, I ran them as like these innocent, naive, like guys are like, oh, hi, I'm the mighty tribal king, you know? And, you know, it's just uh, king, you know, sea moss and what's going on, you know? And the, the players just, oh my God, I love these guys, you know? <laughs> and like anything that ever threatened the Gripply at all just died. Like they, they would not tolerate any threat to the Gripply. Like <laughs> goblins have enslaved two Gripply. There's a fleet of them. There's hundreds of, we'll kill them all. We'll get those two. <laughs> You know, Gripply back. I mean, and there, there was like a pirate, you know, or like there was. It wasn't even a pirate; it was a fisherman. And I gave him the 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 sea captain voice from The Simpsons, you know, the R. And like, players like, oh, I love that guy. Let's go back to him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> And so anytime I wanted to threaten them or wanted to get them to take it seriously, like, oh, Quintus the fisherman is in trouble. <gasps> oh, my God, we can't let that happen. You know? <laughs> but like, oh, there's a group, there's a tribe of innocent elves being threatened by minotaurs. Like, eh, whatever. You know, <laughs> eh. Oh, there's vampires sucking the blood out of random citizens of the colony. Eh, yeah, whatever. We'll make a deal with the vampires. We'll talk to the vampires. Yeah, that, that's cool. You can suck the blood out of those people. They're not funny. They don't entertain us. We don't care. So... <laughs> But if they threaten, if they'd suck the blood out of one Gripply, they'd be like death to all vampires. Um, so, it, it, yeah, that's the kind of thing. I don't know. Does your group kind of react like that? I guess. Yeah, they, sort of- like I keep um, we, we keep running into these things where like I'm I'm throwing opportunities for them to be the good guys, you know, because I'm trying to yeah. run a campaign, not like like not Care Bears or anything, but just. You know, be the heroes. <laughs> yeah, and, um, like they're kind of supposed to be. You know? and, right, and, and the guy's like, no, I murdered them all. You know, I'm just, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a thing. Um, yeah, the New World campaign, the players would all just make, like, oh, so here's a group of lizardmen that you have to fight. Can we make a deal with them? Can we just talk to them? Can we negotiate? <laughs> like, there's an evil minotaur that worships the demon god. Yeah, I'd rather talk to him. Let's pretend <laughs> we're demon cultists, too. Like, okay, here's, you know, some goblins. Ah, kill them all, you know? Like, uh, I could never all predict whether or not they'd want to fight, you know, who, who they'd want to kill and who they'd want to, you know, enslave or out-recruit. Uh, yeah. For their own fiendish ends. Um, um, all right. So, so to bring this like like full circle <laughs> around, have you kicked around the idea of taking uh, your zombie book and like like adapting it to a game system? Because it, it just seems like it's tailor made for that. All, all yeah, those guys I, need I, like I have. Some I've, kind of, I've outlined it. Um, I'm kind of working on. Well, right now I'm working on a zombie no, uh, novel, follow-up novel to Zombies of the World. It's called Dead Power, and it's basically the the main. Uh, I, I mentioned one of the things that in the in the novel is, or in Zombies of the World is there's a research place, research power station where the the, the, the North American Necrological Research Institute (NANRI) is uh, figuring out how to use zombies to power the future and. So Dead Run has thousands and thousands of zombies set up stationary bicycles to power it and, you know, generate power and conduct tests and whatnot. And So you ran with that idea. Yeah, so I ran with that idea. The idea is that, you know, there's a group of people that really want that station shut down. And they can shut it down if there's an outbreak because the government will just bomb it. If there's a big, you know, if they, all the zombies get loose, this government will just bomb it to, you know, keep the rest of the country safe. Uh, the, the, the research station is on an island. Uh, but if it, you know zombies can swim or zombies can float, you know, or sink or whatever, you know, walk across the bottom, um, and so the zombies, uh, so the research, you know, the zombies, some of the zombies escape, but the researchers uh, have this opportunity to try and contain the outbreak before the government will come in. The thing is, the, you know, the researchers can't do it themselves because they're human and the zombies will eat them. Uh, and the idea, and they, they're not, there's not enough of them to just shoot all the zombies. You know, there's the thousands of zombies out there. So the idea is, though, that, you know, one of the things that happens in zombies in the world are intelligent zombies. You know, there's the talking zombies I mentioned earlier. There's also, like, species like the New England ghoul, which is the Lovecraftian ghoul who's a scavenger, just eats dead people. Uh, and so they get some of these intelligent zombies and say, well, you know, if we, we need your help, if you don't help us, you're going to get bombed too. So the zombies and the smart zombies have to work together to fight the dumb zombies or contain the dumb zombies and stop. There's a, a group of humans, mercenaries that come in to try and, you know, make sure that everything stays nice and chaotic so the government will air bomb it because the, the people who are trying to stop this are you know very powerful and rich and oh it's conspiracies anyway so that's a ba- basic conflict is a team of zombies and humans working together to fight you know 
dumb zombies and mercenaries. So um, that that's the main thing. <laughs> Uh, so I'm working on that novel right now. I'm actually I also have a short story that is based in there. It's based on one of the characters. Um, uh, what the backstory of one of the characters in the novel, and uh, I, it's about eight nine thousand words. I'm going to release that as a Kindle short story. Uh, put that up first in the next month or so, and then I will uh, put up. Once I get the novel done, I'm a little half about halfway through with it. Uh, get that up online as an ebook print on demand book. And then, so after that, um, I don't know. I, I, I have outlined zombies of the world as a, as a role playing game. The thing is that there's, there's several, uh, role playing games based specifically on zombies. And, uh, for example, there, you know, all flesh must be eaten. The, the game you were just mentioned, the zombie invasion simulators, uh, you know, outbreak undead. And I had some ideas for game mechanics that would make it stand apart, um, but I don't know if it would, you know, truly, if that would be enough to make it, you know, worth my while. I, I probably will, but I want to get the novel out first. And so that, I'm kind of like trying to just stay focused on one thing at a time. Uh, otherwise I get like, oh, I'll do 10 things at once, you know, <laughs> and then nothing ever gets done. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you guys probably know what I mean. You know, it's easy to get distracted. Like it's, it's um, much more fun to start a project than it is to be like, you know, 30,000 words <laughs> in and be like, yeah. Boy, structuring this novel is really fun. Yeah, I should. Yeah, having five plot lines at once was a real good idea. Uh, <laughs> keeping track of all that stuff, um, which is where I am right now. Like, I have too many plot lines going on, so I should start having the zombies eat more people, uh, so I can simplify <laughs> the novel. Um, but yeah, uh, the, so that that's probably something I will. Uh, I probably will do an RPG for it, but that that's a ways off because I'm working on the novel right now, and after the novel, I don't know. Because it also depends on what the market reacts to. You know, like, Zombies of the World is selling well, but, you know, if the novel does really, really well, I'll probably do that. Because, you know, RPGs are kind of a niche thing. Yeah, it it is. And and that's just wishful thinking on my part. Because, like I said, reading (laughs) reading through Zombies of the World, I I was like, God, all this is missing is hit dice and armor class. (laughs) Well, I mean, that's the thing. Like, some some of the reviews, actually, because of my background, I I actually have written several RPG things. Uh, Not just the PDF and Ransom things, but I've also written uh, two books for arc dream publishing they do uh, i've written two campaigns for uh monsters and other childish things it's a role-playing game based on the idea is like you're a kid and you have an your imaginary mo- a friend is a monster but it's a real monster and it's a thing like calvin and hobbs but hobbs is real and is a lovecraftian monster from beyond time and space but he really <laughs> loves you he just doesn't always understand why he can't eat the mailman um so that like that's the basic premise of it, and so I you know the kid with the monster games. friend genre, <laughs> and so I wrote two books for that. One is called Curriculum of Conspiracy, which is about like teachers and you know at a school trying to trick and fight the students. So teacher, you know, adults versus kids kind of uh, take on it. Yeah. Um, and then I wrote a full campaign called Road Trip, where the idea is you're going on a summer vacation road trip to different spots around the country, and you're trying to save the world from an evil cult that wants to destroy the world by summoning a giant monster that will end everything at Area 51. So, you know, a typical, you know, typical story. Very, very common. Um, and so I wrote those two books uh, for Arc Dream, and so a lot of – some of the reviewers, the recent very convoluted explanation here, um, thought – Zombies of the World was an RPG book, uh, but I specifically left out the RPG stuff simply because I wanted it to get into Barnes and Noble and you know yeah. mainstream yeah. bookstores. Well, it caters. Uh, I mean, it's very well done. It caters to a larger group yeah. of people. Yeah, it it is. Like I said, it's just wishful thinking. But oh um, yeah, no, I, I I trust me. It's not like I wouldn't want to do that uh, eventually. It's just. Um. Yeah, I I can only write so much yeah. uh, so fast, and you know I also podcast too. So what are you talking uh, about uploading and, your mind into like five of you? That would just solve everything. <laughs> yeah, if I could only fork myself like in uh, Eclipse Phase, if I could only have five Rosses running around. So and um, ride, you, you, you seem <laughs> so utterly comfortable in the whole RPG world. Did you grow up playing RPGs? Is is this something? You, yeah, yeah. You grew up uh, doing. I did. Uh, my first role playing game was actually called was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Other Strangeness. Holy crap! I played that one too. <laughs> <laughs> that was the very first one I did. I totally it was put did. up from Palladium, and they based it not on the Saturday morning cartoons. They based it on the original black and white. Eastman yeah, and on Laird the Kitchen comics. Sink productions that that yeah. were done out of like their basement, Eastman and Laird's basement. That's... And like this is the version of the turtles that swear, drink beer, and kill people. Yeah. You know? 
the ones that are, you know, role models on television. Yeah, uh, right. And, you, you didn't have to be a mutant turtle. You could be like a, a mutant mm-hmm. porcupine. There's boxer. actually an actual play of it on the uh, the podcast site where I actually ran people through, and they, they there's a random table to generate what type of character you were. I think there's like a seagull and a pigeon. Uh, you know, for what they wanted to be or what they, they wound up getting. And um, my very first character, my very first adventure was in Team te- Meeting te- te- Other Strangers. I rolled up a raccoon who was a ninja biker. Uh, and then he ran the, the GM ran me through an adventure that was in the book, and I died at the very first possible thing. I opened a door and it was trapped. And there was, you know, five pounds of C4 behind the door. And so my character blew up horribly and I died. And yet I stuck with the hobby. So uh, <laughs> after after that, um, you know, I started getting D&D. I had some battered uh, second edition books. I came in at the very tail end of that. And then third ed started up uh, and, you know, stuck with that. And I also got into Call of Cthulhu. Because I, I picked up a copy of Call of Cthulhu for like ten bucks at a game a bookstore, and it was like, oh my god, this stuff is crazy! Look at all these weird monsters. And uh, then I, you know, I got into Lovecraft for, too, and I, and I was kind of hooked after that. So, um, yeah. So do you I, I have started, the um, Do you have the issue of deities and demigods with the Cthulhu mythos in it? No, I do not. That's I mean, like I've the read, Holy Grail. Yeah. Well, it's not the Holy Grail. Um, I mean, it's reasonably rare. You can, if you go to Gen Con, you can see copies for it, uh, copies with it in there. It, it goes. I mean, it goes for. I've seen it for go for between fifty and two hundred bucks, depending on who's selling it. Sometimes, yeah. you know, depending on the condition, uh, it is. It is pretty rare. Um, there are things that are rare, like the original chainmail. Um, the uh, uh, and I have looked through it. It, it is really neat. Um, but I'm trying to think that the, the real, the, you know, you mentioned really rare gaming items. And I think the rarest thing that I really want isn't even a, an RPG. It's a war game. Um, and this is just personal preference. There's a, you know, back in the day, back like in the sixties and seventies, like war games were ridiculously long and historical and like took, you know, weeks to beat. Um, you know, they had hexagons and little cardboard right. counters. There was one that was called campaign for North Africa. Have you guys heard of this one? What was it called? Campaign for North Africa. It has a Wikipedia article because yeah, it's I have not particularly that. infamous because it's considered the most complex war game ever, like, produced. It's like almost like a joke. Like he like, <laughs> no one's ever completed a game of it because the the estimated playing time is two thousand hours for two <laughs> teams of like five or ten, like for ten people playing it. Like, um, like five to ten people on a side, and it's about the campaign for Africa in World War Two, and it's like it gets down to it's it covers the entire campaign, all of Africa, but you have to keep track of individual pilots, mm. like that's the level of detail they get, and they have things like water evaporation rates, you know, oh, like no. how fast, water, <laughs> like like even the Italian units have slightly higher water evaporation rates than the other units because they boil water to make spaghetti. Like that is the <laughs> level of detail they have in this game, and you know, in division level, com- you know, uh, uh, game. So it's like uh, unimaginable complexity. And so, like, I want to get that just to read it, yeah. just to see how utterly insane it is. That like yeah. people pay bought this, but they, again, that's like a really rare game, and it's also really expensive. Um, so though that would be my personal, you know, like holy grail of gaming. But like there are like the Cthulhu one is pretty rare. Um, Chainmail is also rare. Oh uh, God! There, I can't remember what the the rest of them are, but uh, they're like especially stuff from the late seventies is really uh, usually pretty hard just, to find. You know, like I, I just, I don't know. I'm like nerding out all over the place here, but um, I, I just remember <laughs> going to the bookstore and buying my Red Box A D and D set when I was a kid, and it was that was a that was like a profound day. Oh yeah, I remember what got me into D and D was I had a. Um, um, Apple Two C, and I was playing um, the Dragonlance series, Dark Queen of Cran. On, mm. on that's what really got me into it. And then, I mean, of course, that's a computer game, but yeah, it, it that was, is what launched me to all the others. <laughs> yeah, the Red Box, like in the early '80s, was like the apex of D and D and role playing game popularity. Like that's when they were selling millions of units, uh, or hundreds of thousands of units, uh, making millions of dollars. I mean, the third ed wave of like 2000 was kind of you know, almost not didn't get to that level, 
Yeah, you know, or yeah, didn't even yeah get to that level, but it was still pretty popular. But yeah, I mean, um, yeah, those those yeah that that shaped a generation and like everyone has you know, influenced the world. Like I, I, it got to be, of course, that led to the you know satanic panic of yeah. the '80s too, where people like, oh, D and D will lead you to the <laughs> devil, you know. And uh, uh, have you seen the uh, Jack Chicks uh, comic Dark Dungeons? Um, no, but I would love that because I collect the Chick Tracks. If ever, oh, whenever yeah. I find them anywhere, like I always, I I got them stashed. You can get away. them online too if you go to chick dot com. You can you he has all of them online for free. You can just read all of them. Uh, and Dark Dungeons is about role playing games. Oh my and gosh. at one point, the person's like, "Your character is dead, killed by a zombie." <laughs> no, Blackleaf, no. And, <laughs> And then, like, she runs out away, and then later on, she hang. If Blackleaf is dead, I can't go on living, and she she hangs herself because of her character. Oh my gosh. It's like that's D and D, <laughs> and like, wow, I, it was amazing. Um, uh, really my favorite Jack Chick, aside from that, my second favorite Jack Chick, uh, um, uh, track comic is i can't remember what it's called but it's a black exploitation one and i kid you not like it's the black badass protagonist gets out of prison and like goes on this rampage to get revenge and like there's a gunfight in it where he kills somebody with an m16 throws a grenade but then he accepts you know god and you know christ and uh, right as he's bleeding out from his gunshot wounds and like you know uh, is saved at the last moment but it's it's just incredible uh so those those are my two favorite but yeah they're all crazy crazy as hell and quite entertaining I love Chick Tracks, man. They are so cool. Yeah, they it, are. It's like, I'm... it's like it's like a big portfolio of crazy. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not even like you know in the typical kind of like stuff you'd expect the evangelical stuff. It's they really go on these like weird like conspiracy theory tangents. Yeah, like, yeah. You're like, oh, the 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 dirty Catholics and the you know they they're gonna can put you in a new world order or the the the, the Islamists are really worshiping a moon god and they're yeah. gonna put you in a new world order. They do and, go to strange places. Yeah, they really do, and uh, the art in them is just hard to like describe too i mean it's kind of like that realistic kind of like soap opera thing you know <laughs> like a mary yeah. worth comic but yeah that's what they fun. always reminded me of they were like brenda star like yeah. a brenda star on acid yeah exactly yeah it really is like in, <laughs> in a paranoid view like they're all out to get me they're all out to steal my soul you know i mean it's really uh, uh a unique thing we should um, make a role-playing game out of that yeah <laughs> That they have made a couple of games, like I mean, not like specific, but there's like been Rapture games and stuff like that. Oh, like that really, sounds fun. Yeah, <laughs> I've uh, well, they're all like D20 games, so like, they're not they can't be that fun. Um, so I'm sorry, <laughs> there's there back in the third edition days, there was a lot of really bad supplements made that were just really cheap, you know, poorly produced stuff back in the gold rush days of the OGL. So um, like if you go to a gaming convention now, you'll just see rows of that stuff, yeah. and it's all like, oh, uh, ends D twenty. Like here's something really obscure and cheap. We just threw it out there, but here's a half naked pixie girl on it. Buy it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you'll buy it anyway. Yeah, exactly. Or you know, D twenty modern, D twenty black exploitation, D twenty future, D twenty this, D twenty that, D twenty everything. So. Dude, this is your chance to cash in on D20 Zombie. <laughs> yeah, I, they they have assuredly done that. Uh, and, yeah, I, that, that that has come – that that ship has sailed. <laughs> <laughs> it's come and gone. Yeah. Uh, if anything, it would be like a Pathfinder Zombies now because Pathfinder is sort of it, it, the, the, the open market now. Or, yeah, I don't know. It would be kind of interesting to see how that works out. Um the whole four. I mean, I'm sure you guys are aware of the fourth ed versus Pathfinder argument. Uh, no, I'm unfamiliar with that. Well, have you heard of Pathfinder? I have. I have not played it though. Okay. Well, Pathfinder is really like third edition. It's really three version three point seven five, and it it's basically like for people who just like oh I see fourth ed and I hate it so uh, it's an MMO you know and oh I'm gonna stick with Pathfinder and like. 
I mean, Pathfinder has great art, and their adventures are usually really good. Um, in fact, I uh, was at Gen Con this year, and Gen Con is like the biggest role playing game convention in yeah. the in the country. Like thirty six thousand people showed up, and one my book Road Trip was up for an Innie, which is like the industry awards for role playing games awesome. uh, for best adventure. And um, the, the the problem is is that. Um, Pathfinder was also for an award in that category. They had an adventure in that category. And when Pathfinder is nominated for something, the fans make sure it wins. Yeah. Uh, so if Pathfinder won every single category it was nominated for. Wow. And that, that, so, you know, they're good adventures, but I can't, you know, like, oh, oh yeah, you're, they're great. But like, you know, I'm just, I, I'm not too proud to admit that I'm a little bitter at that. So, uh, I think anybody that, would. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but Pathfinder is basically the Pathfinder fans really hate fourth edition and they really like there's a ton of flame wars and things on like ianworld.org, rpg.net and other sites where people are like, oh, fourth ed's horrible, Pathfinder's great, or Pathfinder's horrible, you know, uh fourth ed's good, and you know, back and forth, back and forth. Um and they just go on and on and on and on and on. And it's it's just kind of like the uh, people write stuff now for Pathfinder. And people write stuff for fourth. Well, they're not not many people write stuff for fourth ed because the the GSL, which is the license for fourth ed, is a lot more restrictive than the OGL, which is the open gaming license for third ed uh, publishing. Yeah. Sorry. No, I, yeah. See, I, I'm unaware of that. I'm unaware of that fight. Um, and and I'm playing fourth edition now, and and I like it. it it's a lot of fun. I I, I enjoy it. I mean, it's yeah. It's no, I mean, I did run a campaign. We, a year we, and we've half like campaign picked now. up some new players who are new to the game, and it's it's easy to pick up. And I like the new map based combat. And well, I mean, it it really does solve the the fundamental problem that with third ed, which was spellcasters were inherently better than non spellcasters. I mean, like a fighter in third ed or in Pathfinder is like I hit it with my sword, you know, every yeah. round, uh, or I power attack it every single round. And uh, in fourth ed, they actually have options. I mean, they they're actually balanced. The classes are balanced for one another. It's not just wizard or cleric supremacy. Um, but I mean, yeah, fourth ed isn't perfect, but it it, it mechanically it's a big improvement over that. No, but. It, it it isn't it isn't perfect, but I do like it from the DM's perspective because, it, because I think it I don't know it allows it allows I mean at the end of the day what you're trying to do is tell a story, yeah, and it allows you to do that in a in a in a tangible way because you know it's not like you know all right you're in a room it's ten yeah. by ten you know whatever you just I don't know it's just um. I think the the map based combat helps, and um, and and I don't know, it's a lot of fun. It's it's and and this is like back to my comment regarding the horror games. It's a chance for some friends to get together and you know drink a few beers, roll a few dice, have some laughs, and and enjoy yourselves. Yeah, um, I mean for me, like, well, one thing is that it's not necessarily telling; it's making a story, but with the other people. Because the great thing I love about role playing more than anything else is that you never know exactly what the story is going to be until it actually happens at the table. Like yeah, you say yeah. like, here's the scenario. They're going to rescue a kidnapped princess and the players are like, okay, we rescue her. And all right, now we're going to go to the desert and find those ruins. What? Well, they're, they're right. Don't you want to return the princess to the king for the, your reward? Well, yeah, but the ruins are right next to us. And it's a, you know, it's a pain in the ass to get there. So we're going to have the princess haul the treasure for us. And then yeah. so like it turns into this totally bizarre story where, you know, they're, they've enslaved the princess uh, as, you know, forced labor as they go, you know, in the dungeon. You're like, uh, uh, okay. So um, you never know exactly how the players are going to react. So there's always this room for this, this entirely new story to be, you know, uh, shape. Uh, take shape uh, without no one exact, no one person exactly uh, what's going to happen. So that's what I love about it. Yeah. And um, the yeah, I mean the mechanics are kind of a back issue. It's it's just uh, Pathfinder, you know, Third Ed. I ran plenty of games in that in Third Ed too, and those were fine. It's just there are certain issues that are kind of unbalanced, and Fourth Ed solves them. I, I think it's kind of ironic. The the Pathfinder people are always saying that oh fourth ed's a like World of Warcraft it's an MMO you know oh you have tanks you have defenders blah 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 and they don't realize back in, when third ed came out people compared it to Diablo and Diablo two like oh it's like Diablo two with 
feats, you know, like in, in third ed, you had feet train. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, trees where you had like, oh, you get weapon focus, then greater weapon focus. Then, you know, and keep improving that. Like, oh, it's just like Diablo. Oh, my God. This is terrible. Second edition with Thack, you know, Thacko. And stuff oh, like no, that. don't say Thacko. No, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how crazy these people are. So uh, Flame Wars never die. Flame Wars. Flame Wars never change. Yeah. Uh, eh. I like so um, that's yeah. <laughs> what, what 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 can I say? So um, anyway, zombies. How about them? Yeah, uh, hey, what about them zombies? Right on. Yeah, um, yeah. I do want to. Yeah, so I'm I'm working on uh, that. Um, did you guys? I want to know like what were, what were your did you have any particular your favorite species for zombies of the world uh, since you looked through it? Um, I the I thought the um I thought the revenants were good and I and I. I'm. I have more of an appreciation for the Aztec zombie <laughs> now that you explain the robot versus because I because I, I remember reading it and I was like I don't quite get the joke here. And I know. Now, now so, I'm like I I, oh, I, I, I really did like I'm I put that in there to amuse myself. Like <laughs> I I didn't like care if the people got it or not. Like I like the movie the robot versus the Aztec mummy because it's totally insane and it makes no sense whatsoever. So I'm going to throw this in here. But that's what makes the, the whole book good is that you actually walk away from it. Because, you know, normally when you read a zombie survival guide, you walk away from it you're like, yeah, you know, we've we've had the same drunken conversation. Yeah. Um, and with this book, you don't walk away like that. You walk away, you know, with an essence of that, but with more a little bit more deeper knowledge of it's like, hey, I can actually bring this up in an argument. Yeah. And, um, and you can also, and there's just, you know, you, everyone, not everyone will get every single reference, I think. Yeah. Well, probably uh, some people will. Um, but so, you know, uh, there are some people that are, you know, you're going to get some of the references and those are the references. You're like, ha ha ha, I know those and the other people don't. So man, that's what's I fun. know more about <laughs> zombies. Ah. I, I think, I think if I, if I had to answer my, my favorite zombie, now bear in mind that, that this answer comes from the perspective, like I was reading this, like it was the monster manual and I'm yeah. thinking like, what would be the coolest zombie to throw at my player characters? Yeah. And it'd be the Chinese jumping zombie. Cause it yeah. has the most like, <laughs> what the fuck going on for it. And that's a real thing. Like the, they're, they're, <laughs> that is from Chinese mythology, like Chinese yeah. folklore. There are Chinese hopping corpses. Uh, and like you see them back in the 17th century, there's like an alchemist who like wrote about how, oh, their bad energy goes out. And that's why they become hopping corpses. That's why we have to wrap the bodies up so they don't get up and eat us and eat our souls. And yeah. Like then they became popular in Hong Kong movies during the eighties, like mm-hmm. Samuel Hong and other people. There's like they, they call them. They're also called Chinese hopping vampires, but they act like zombies. They hop around. They're stiff. They're slow. They're not really you know. They're not really vampires, but yeah. Some people can. There's like a movie called Mr. Vampire about you know hopping corpses. They're 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 a staple of those types of movies, uh, and then you see them in video games like. Um, there's a character in the in the from Darkstalkers, the fighting game uh, yeah, where like yeah, yeah. you know there's a werewolf and there's you know Frankenstein and blah 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 blah. One of them is a hopping corpse. Uh, it's I can't remember her name, but she's the one with like the the plastic man arms kind of thing. Like she can s- extend her limbs yeah. and yeah. So like there there there's this huge. It's like a common thing over there. Like my brother, he's actually living in China right now, teaching uh, political science at a university there, um, and he. Uh, went to a Halloween party and like there were people dressed up as hopping corpses and they're like zombies I'm a zombie you know like that's <laughs> what they think a zombie is and that's yeah that's that's a thing that's that, I didn't <laughs> yeah. make that I out of whole that cloth up. I made that like the only zombie I kind of made out out of whole cloth was the fleshless zombie and that was more like I wanted to have skeletons in there you know like from Clash of right. the Titans the original one but like a skeleton. It could be totally a skeleton because, like you know, then they then there'd be no ligaments to connect them. There's got to be some meat there. And, and that's that's the thing. When I when I saw the flesh of zombie, the first thing I thought of was Hellraiser and Frank. When I, yeah, when exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that kind of thing too. You know, uh, uh, the 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 Clive Barker esque, you know, u- uber gore kind of you know supernatural horror, yeah. uh, nameless horror kind of thing. So, um, yeah, yeah. There's there's a great. Um, um, book from the Edinburgh University that um, focuses on Japanese horror and they, they, there's a there's a good chapter of, of about the, the zombies and the hopping zombies in there um, but for the life of me I can't remember the name of the, name of the book but I have a, uh, is it Japanese or uh, they're not really a staple of Japanese it's really a Chinese emoji. yeah they 
that's what they were talking about. They were just talking about, you know, they were talking H, about you know, just kind of. I mean, like they, the they have been in like there are there's a. Uh, uh, they have been in like uh, Japanese, you know, made video games. Like the people of Japan are aware of them. They're, they show up in some animes uh, and manga. Uh, I mean, again, it's kind of like a staple, hokey kind of monster. It's kind of like the fish man or you yeah. know the wolf man to us. You know, that's kind of like, oh hopping corpse. <laughs> oh, that's silly. They want to eat our souls. Um, you know, th- th- that's not a super scary thing to them. It's not like you know a little boy, you know, in in white, or you know, a girl yeah. in a white dress with, with really black long hair, black yeah. hair. <laughs> you know, that's the really scary thing now in Japan. So, uh, you know, like from the ring and everything. So. Yeah, and that's what they were talking about. They were um, just kind of taking the 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 history of you know of how society, how the horror movies really reflect the society there. Mm-hmm. And they, they were- yeah, I mean, there's there's been a lot of people talking about like the differences between vampires and zombies. How vampires kind of pop up in like democratic administrations, and zombies become more popular in Republican yeah. administrations. But I mean, that's kind of sim- that's a very simplistic reading of it. Um, you know, vampires are really like the hidden predator. You know, the 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 rapist, the serial killer, the guy who looks normal, but he's really you. Know, know a very violent and dangerous person yeah uh they're also you know metaphor for disease you know aids and you know syphilis and uh, plague and all these other things that's sort of what the folklore was about too you know they're you know that people didn't get you know the black death because of rats they got it because of a vampire let's go dig up that guy's grave put a stake in his heart and then put a heavy stone over it you know um there's a great documentary that our other co-host who's not here tonight um did the soundtrack to was nightmares in red white and blue um, and it, it goes into great detail about that as well. It's really, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and zombies again are more about collective fears, like, you know, the masses, you know, especially I think today now, cause the world is so unstable that zombies are very popular because, you know, people are afraid of, you know, rioting masses, you know, yeah. rioting, you know, Occupy Wall Street or the Arab Spring and thing like that. And that, that triggers a lot of anxiety in people. And even before then you had things like disasters like Hurricane Katrina and stuff like that, that sort of, uh, uh, and the, even the whole war on terror sort of triggers this kind of like, fear that it's going like it's interesting you know the vampire is individually more dangerous you know vampires intelligent tool using clever and all this other stuff but you know it's zombie like vampires have to hide out from everyone they they they, they're they're isolated they're alone and they're they're if they if they're discovered they're dead you know that's the implication that's why they have to hide but zombies don't care they just show up and they destroy everything like they they that that's kind of the different dynamic is that they're the, the harbingers of everything that will end all of civilization even though they're pathetic individually very pathetic um but we just assume that zombies mean the end of everything you know that, that, that's the end of civilization um they're the living and, form and, of, what, of uh, what a virus is but more yeah deadly <laughs> um and you also have like things like one of the movies i think is sort of underappreciated is daybreakers um which I, is about uh it came out a couple of years ago yeah, yeah ethan hawk yeah, Ethan Hawke in it, and um, like they, you know, show a society of vampires, you know, you know, living off humans, uh, you know, in blood banks, uh, blood farms, and they they actually show like what happens when vampires don't get blood; they turn into zombies, or what they call they call them subsiders. But the idea is that you know they're these mindless, horrific monsters that feast on whatever they can, uh, and that's kind of uh, an interesting dynamic. Is that the vampires are even the vampires are afraid of zombies, yeah. of becoming zombies. They're just as terrified of, uh, of them as we are, as the the normal humans. So um, nobody wants to be an aphid. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No one wants to be a blood, you know, mindless, uh, you know, horribly uh, addicted to uh, flesh or blood yeah. type of monster. So, uh, yeah, talk about a face where <laughs> fate worse than death. Um, so, yeah. No, I, I really, really enjoyed your book. I, I want to thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah. Um, I, I recommend everyone picking it up. Um, as we mentioned earlier before in the show, you can get it. In the physical uh, brick and yeah, brick and mortar uh, stores like and Barnes and Noble, um, the website is zombiesoftheworld dot com. Yeah. Um, you can also buy it from there. Amazon, pretty much any place that sells books would probably have it. 
Well, those are the three places that I've reached through yet. I haven't gone to independent bookstores yet. Uh, unless you're in Springfield, Missouri, then I have. <laughs> uh, uh, that's like, hey. Distribution, like as I mentioned earlier, is kind of a bitch. Uh, it's kind of a problem. Uh, so it, it's very complex. Um, but yeah, if you if you and if you order directly from me, leave a message in your PayPal. Like I use PayPal for payment processing. Uh, m like mention like, hey, can you please autograph my copy? And I'd be happy to autograph oh, it for nice, you. So, nice. um, or you know, you don't have to. So, uh, and I ship internationally too. So if you're overseas, I'll uh, you have to pay more for shipping. But I'll I ship copies to Australia and you know Germany and you know Sweden and Norway and different places. So um, I, I'm in Canada, obviously. So uh, yeah, I'd be happy to ship them wherever. So what's so. the oddest request you've received from your book? Um. Well, I mean, well, I have. Let's see. Uh, I'm like in terms of like what people have requested for yeah. like the autographs or whatever. Um, I'm trying to think. I have. I've had a. Uh, well, of course, people have like requested not just me signing it, but like the the people on the podcast. Like I have a lot of the people oh, who are nice. fans of RPBR yeah. uh, order copies, and then they want you know Tom and the other people who play in the game to sign it. So, um, and. I that that I've had one person you know uh, ask for a message and I said ah this I wrote I wrote it up as a mythos tome uh, call Cthulhu mythos tome this book costs one d one three you know one <laughs> slash one d six sanity to read plus ten Cthulhu <laughs> mythos That's spells fun. raise zombie so uh, that was probably that would obviously be the, the weirdest one so yeah if you give me if you give me uh, I've also sent off like occasionally I'll send off character if I know it's a podcast fan I'll send them a little bit of swag like we run a lot of games with different systems and so um i have tons of spare character sheets uh, that have been used for one shots like dead call cthulhu characters and so i'll just use them as packing material i'll just ship them off with other people oh, so nice. i've had one person like this guy was a uh worked in a slaughterhouse and was a meth dealer i want to hear about this game you know, like, <laughs> game i haven't posted yet so uh, he didn't make it. <laughs> the player character didn't make it, by the way. So uh, the meth dealer was consumed by the giant flesh monster. Um, good times. Excellent. So, <laughs> good times. Well, excellent. anyways, um, but yeah, uh, buy my book. Do buy it. my book. It is it's definitely worth it. I mean, it, it doesn't matter how much of a zombie freak you think you are. You will definitely walk away from this yep. book. With oh, some it's new also uh, I have it as an ebook too. I didn't want. I, I can't believe I mentioned this. Uh, you can you can buy it as a PDF from my site, which is the same layout as the actual print book, or you can get the Kindle version, which has full color illustrations in it. So if you Kindle Fire, you can actually see it. And I'm working to get it for like EPUB for the iPad and everything else. Yeah. Um, and it is uh, $2.99 as an ebook. So it'd be a great a stocking deal. stuffer for people Three with Kindles. Three lousy dollars. Yeah, exactly. Man, like, why not? Need Ten thousand people to order it. That way. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, oh, all right. Um, well, I have the PDF on my phone. I gotta tell you, I, I've, I've used it to settle a couple of arguments, and I, I look forward <laughs> yeah, to using it, it for more. Nice, nice. I'm, I'm glad I could be uh, of service. Um, and, I'm, that, and I'm going to buy the actual physical copy because I love the artwork in it. Um, I mean, I love the book itself, but I, I definitely want to have a physical copy of it. So yeah, uh, yeah, it's in full color. It's in glossy pages too. Yeah. Like you'll be really happy with the the print quality. It's like um, the the Tinwall Press. They usually do art books and stuff like that. But you know, since they're in Singapore, it, they can print books very cheap. So uh, Are you something that even I can Singapore afford. Cheap? No, I'm yeah. just kidding. So. Uh, yeah, it will, uh, it, it, like there are reviews, uh, that have just commented just on the quality of the print. So, uh, uh, yeah, cool. I'm nice. looking forward to getting the order. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, again, everybody should go to zombiesoftheworld.com and you can learn everything that you possibly want to know about because you have links to your, your podcast and everything from that website as well, right? Um. Uh, yeah. Or the, yeah. Uh, I believe so. And if not, they can like. Uh, uh, I have a link on my Twitter account, and you can just Google RPPR. And we'll have, have yeah. We'll, we'll have links in the show notes. Um, when yeah. This goes goes up. Um. Well, thank you so much for spending the evening with us talking about your book and role playing yeah. games. Oh uh, yeah, man. We it's been a lot it. of fun. It has been. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love talking about it. I, I, I can talk about zombies and role-playing games all day long, as you, I, I, as you can tell. So, uh, 
Um, if you want to do a contest or anything, um, we can talk off air about that if sure. you're interested sure. in that. So. Yeah, we can do that. All uh, right. Um, well, again, thank you so much, everybody. Run to his website, zombiesoftheworld.com. Pick up his book. Pick up the ebook. It's definitely worth it. No, that was a good interview. I'm glad we actually got to talk to him. Holy crap, that was fun, man. Yes. I, I, <laughs> I didn't think it was going to go off in all those directions. <laughs> But it's it's really good. I mean, because I I think it's one to good that we know how deep he is into D and D because you know we're yeah. You, um, Dude, you Matt said and everybody's you kicking that guy off for the show, man. You said you wanted like a D and D nerd. I'm your guy. Yep, you got it. Um, and then we're you know we're gonna do the D and D podcast. It's coming up fairly. soon. I cannot so. wait. We're gonna record it this Thursday. Yeah. And uh, it'll be a long gaming session, and then we'll just chop it up into episodes. And I, I cannot believe how compelling I have found listening to actual play podcasts, which I just learned that that's what they're called now. Yeah. And uh, it, it it's like, I don't know, I, I like listening to it. And, it. and it's interesting because you what you're doing essentially is you're hearing a story take place. And it's like, it it's like... You know, when you read a novel, the author has written the words on the page, and and there they are. They're done, right? But when you hear these um, actual play podcasts, what you hear is like the nuts and bolts of how the story how does develops. How it builds, yeah. Decided upon the randomness of a D20, and, and which and I it, think is kind of neat. It's like Ross was saying in, in, the, in the interview we just did with him. He was talking about how you can write the story. You can you can oh, be the, go another And direction. then you, he's like, you save the princess. Don't you want to take the princess back to the castle? Yeah, they They're like, do. no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, players never want to do what, what, what they're well, supposed to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so right. So, so what it is is like you know the guy who's the DM. He's telling the story, but really what he's doing is he's just kind of navigating. Yeah, but, yeah the he's story. just making sure it doesn't get way out of hand and just. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then like the players are deciding where it goes, and it's so. It, I I didn't think if you'd have told me it was as compelling as it is to listen to, I wouldn't have believed it. And that's true because you think about it, you're like, I mean, I think it's just maybe because of this the stigma that's attached to D and D. Because um, anytime you think about. Um, that's unfairly applied. Well, I know, but I'm just saying if you if you just think about it, it's like, oh, why would I want to sit around and listen to a bunch of people play D and D? Yeah, but well, then, you but know, when I, you think I, about I it, think but, I think it's fun listening to them play because, like, so one, I'm interested in to hear where the story's going to go. But then there's other times where the guy's like, uh, I attack with my long sword, and the guy's like, what's the damage? And you hear like shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. All right, he's looking pause, it up. And I'm like, oh my god, it's D10. Come on. <laughs> But it's, it's definitely something that people, you know, are into it because I, I loved, I mean, I, I guess it could be true because when I was younger, I used to read the Dragonlance series. Um, Those are good books. With R.A. What's R.A. Um, That's not R.A. Salvatore. That was Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. Thank you. The yeah. Dragonlance. Yeah. And I, you know, the, the legends, I was really getting into all that. Yeah. Um, Those were very compelling books. They were really, and, really you know, good. Oddly enough, um. Right, and so in, in the other guy you're thinking of was R. A. Salvatore, but he who was, wrote he, the Driss Duarden novels, which I didn't think were nearly as good. No. However, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman they left the Dragonlance stuff behind, and they wrote some other novels which were god awful. Like they were horrible. I couldn't believe really? like, how bad they were. Based because my expectation was that I would get something as good as Dragonlance, and I, I don't know. Maybe Dragonlance, Dragonlance was, was like lightning in a bottle. That was so very good. It, it was like one of those series that you just could not get enough of. Yeah, that was a great, great like role playing world yeah. setting, struggle, great characters, really, really good. And I, and I think what also added to because I was playing D anD D back then too, so I would, I would you know at night read the novel and then. During the, you know, during the day, you know, friends and I would play D and D, and it just, it just, it just, it was a perfect time for that for that moment for me, I guess. But anyway, we we've talked about D and D a lot. Tonight, I so. know. Um, I'm like nerding out on. Well, I I think we need to at least have some movies, <laughs> <laughs> just just some essence, you know, element of of a movie in here. So there was there's been a trailer that's just released of a of a story that we've known. 
growing up. Is it set Basically. in the D and D world? No, it's not set in the D and D world. It's set in Jack and the Beanstalk world. It could be set in the. It, D&D I guess it could be. <laughs> I guess it could be <laughs> giants. You know, <laughs> magical beans. I guess yeah. But no, this is um, Jack the Giant Killer. Yeah. And the trailer is released today. It looks actually really good. I, I mean, know. I don't. I don't know how I feel about them bringing back or you know these stories because they're doing it a lot they're doing red riding hood um of course the woman who did uh uh twilight did the red riding hood story um what's her name why can i remember um the director yeah uh not julie Taymor. um that's but else. but anyway she, she did she did the the red riding hood story and there's a couple other you know stories that we grew up with and, and this is jack and the beanstalk called jack the giant Catherine killer Hardwick. thank you yeah and it looks good. It looks and it's great. It's, it's going to be three D. I saw some epic three D shots there. You know, in the in the trailer that would look, I, I would imagine would look great in three D. Well, the director um, is Brian Singer, and he's right. So, so he's the director of Jack the Giant Killer, and I think he's a phenomenal guy. I've loved all of his movies. Which ones has he done? He did the first two X Men movies. Those were good. Yeah. And um, his first movie was, uh, I don't know if it was his first movie, but his first like feature success was um, uh, Usual Suspects. That's a good movie, too, yeah. And then, and then that from was a that, really good movie. He, um, he did the first X-Men movie, which the first X-Men movie was, was groundbreaking in that it showed that you could make a superhero movie and you didn't have to have the guy in there for comedic effect. You didn't have to have some buffoon or cartoonish character. Everybody was taken seriously. Yeah. Um, so he did a lot with that. And then, um, so he did, so he did X-Men and then, uh, X2, X-Men United. And then, um, he was going to do the third X-Men movie. Uh, but, he got uh, he got pulled off of that to go do the Superman movie, which Superman Returns, which I thought was phenomenal. I didn't see it. Man. I like that a lot yeah. because he um, and, and again, I think he's a, I think he's a bold guy. Like, um, so you're saying he's a very solid director? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's without a doubt. Um, so with that said, with with that caliber of films that you've listed there, are nothing like Jack and the Beans or Jack the Giant Killer in terms of story. Um, do you think he could give this this storyline justice? Do you think he oh, could absolutely. give it? Uh, yeah, yeah. He'll he'll take it in a new direction. He'll you know. He'll well, obviously in the pressure. trailer he's he's taking it in a new direction. I mean, um, yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to that. And, and like you know, the trailer you can't really tell where it's gonna go. I mean, who knows? Yeah. But um, it's 3D, so it doesn't matter. Uh, and and <laughs> and um, and for that matter. That's really going to rely on the on the screenwriter and you know what what, what script he has to work with. But, yeah. Um, but I think I think Singer is uh, I think Singer is a talented guy and in that um, I think he'll deliver the goods. Okay. Well, we'll keep you posted on what okay. when more stuff comes up. Because I mean, see I, it. I I think Miley when she saw the trailer, she seemed interested in it, and that it's in three D. It would probably be one that we will go see together and. Um, because, I mean, it does look interesting. It doesn't look... <laughs> it looks good enough. Even Miley might go see <laughs> <laughs> And that's saying a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's one of... You're right. Uh, watching the trailer, like, I, I'm I'm hopeful and excited, you know? Like, but we're so always often, hopeful and excited about it. I know. But, but so often there's that movie where I'm like, oh, God, it's going to suck. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be awful. Yeah. Yeah. So... Yeah, it looks very cool. Yeah. So we'll see how it comes out. Um, there is a film. Okay, well, let me back up. There is a series of books that have really made classic reading fun for people, um, like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Um, and there's Abraham, Abraham Lincoln, the Vampire Hunter, has now been made into a movie. Um, it's supposed to hit theaters in June 2012. Um it's presented by Tim Burton, directed by um, Timur. I don't know how to say his last name. I believe it's pro- it's pronounced Timur McMembekov. He is the guy who did the Night Watch, Day Watch. 
and one. It, it was supposed to be the trilogy, but they haven't done the third one yet. Yeah. And I wish they would do the third one. We always one. joke at the video store, like, people come in and rent them, and they're like, oh, my God, Night Watch and Day Watch is so good. When's the third movie coming out? And I'm like, and I don't know, but it's going to be starring Brad Pitt. <laughs> That's funny. But both of those movies I I enjoyed. I, yeah, I they're lo- very cool. Yeah, they, they were the biggest budgeted Russian movies made. They, yep. um, and it shows. Yeah, Um and I, I hear people argue about it all the time that he took it over the top, you know. It's but supposed to be over the top. It is. I, I love those movies. They're, I mean, I actually, I love them so much, I have them in my DVD collection. Um, but anyway, he's directing Abraham Lincoln, The Vampire Hunter. And yeah. two movie posters have been released this week. One a day version and one a night version. They are pretty much the same posters. It has what we assume is... Abraham Lincoln with a top hat covering his face. He's sitting in a chair with with a cane. And one of them, the night one, he is outside with a full moon behind him. Um, and there's, you know, the fog wrapping around him. Yeah, and he's got the signature stovepipe hat. Yeah. And um, the day poster is him inside of a, like a library, like an yeah. old, old, old room um, with the sun coming through the window. It's the same pose, you know, sitting in the chair. Um I, I wish there was more to it, but you know that uh, that's that's the teaser that's coming out. I, I like that idea of like the blending of genres. Yeah, I, I think it's a. I don't know. It's it's like uh, it's like unexplored territory, man. It's like we're on another planet. I would just want to see where it goes. I wanna... So, you, would you be disappointed if it t- took more of a historical realism to it, minus the vampire aspect of it? I'm not sure how historically accurate it can be when it's titled. I know Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln the vampire, vampire, but I'm just saying is like you know it's it's still historically in the same. You know, it could be set up like I mean, of course, if you read the book, but I'm just saying it could be set up where he, you know, he's president, civil war is going on, and then at night he has to go out and kill all these vampires. I don't know. Kind of like you Buffy could, or you whatever. Could, you could, I'm, sh- I'm sure it's easy <laughs> enough to ground it in reality a little bit. Yeah. Um, but would you be, but, what I'm asking is, would you be disappointed if it took, if it was grounded in reality in terms of like when you, you saw certain settings and certain um, things that happen have historical reference to it? Oh, no, versus, I would expect that. I, I, I would expect it to be historically relevant. I, right. I, would, I would expect it to to have those historical milestones. It's going to have to hit those points because otherwise... It, it would wouldn't be, relate to people, I guess. Well, otherwise it'd be like Joe Blow, Vampire Hunter. So it has Wearing to, a top in order hat. for it to be... <laughs> yeah. You know, in order, in order for it to be Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, it has to, you know, it has to show him growing up in the log cabin in Kentucky. And, yeah. You know, all of those, those stories in school room lessons that you're taught about abraham lincoln yeah um whether they're true or not and uh so, so yeah it has to go it has to go there in order to be the vamp the abraham lincoln vampire hunter story yeah um well, you know and that's that's the, i think that's the beauty of the blending of the genres that's the that's the whole like mashup appeal is that i know the abraham lincoln story the story I don't know is Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Yeah. <laughs> you know how it ends. You just don't. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know the whole a- the Abe Lincoln aspect of it that I'm familiar with. But the seedy underbelly of his life, you don't. Yeah, know. <laughs> there's this whole new facet that I was unaware of. Yeah. No, I'm excited. What do you think about having Tim Burton and Timor? Um, Paired up for this, I know, I know he, Tim are, Burton is yeah, just I, producing I, I, it, but you know he Tom Burton's putting element in there. You can tell by the, the just the way the posters look. Yeah, uh, I, I you know it's funny those two I think are a natural pair. Yeah, I, I think they're I think they're a natural pair. And um, uh, I'm not sure what Tim Burton's involvement was in Wanted, if at all. Was uh, Wanted was another McMembikov movie. It was based on a comic book. Um, it was one that starred Angelina Jolie and. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah! But um, I never saw it. But I know what you're name? talking about. Yeah. Uh, it's a good movie, and yeah. it's based on a comic book too, a Mark Miller comic. Uh, 
So, but then after that, they co-produced that uh, CGI movie Nine. I don't know if you oh, ever yeah, saw yeah, that yeah, with yeah. the stitch pumps. With this, yeah. Um, which that was kind of clever. That movie, I think it worked better as a short film than a feature film. Yeah, because it was a really good short film, and that's what... Um, but, uh, but you know, it's like seeing their name together as co-producers of that, it just it was a natural pairing. I just, uh, you know, like, of course those guys would get along. Of course yeah. that they, you know, they would have um, their, their, you know, whatever their vision was is like they're both looking in the same direction. Yeah. And, um... And yeah, so I I think this would be, um, I don't know. It's it's a it's a natural pairing. Well, Benjamin Walker is going to play Abraham in this film. Um, Honest Abe. Yep. Um, Do we know what he's been in before? I think I looked it up, but now I've forgotten it. He's been in Flags of Our Fathers. Um, let me see. Not much. Kinsey. Kinsey. Uh, uh, Kinsey. Yeah, that was a good movie. But he he just played him when he was nineteen. But yeah, a relative unknown. Yeah. Yeah, he played a young Kinsey. He was in uh, Flags of Our Fathers. I don't know. It'd be interesting. I'm kind of glad they're get getting people that we're not. Because um, that's that's one of my bad my my hell-bent things about World War Z is that Brad Pitt, you know, we're, they're getting big-name actors for that. Um, I, I, I like to see people that I'm not very familiar with in films. But anyway. No. Nah. It's funny because, you know, um, okay, so Benjamin Walker was originally cast to play Beast in X-Men First Class. But he walked away from the role to go to Broadway to do Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. But then the guy that was Beast in X-Men First Class um, was uh, was the guy from uh, oh, from Jack the Jack Giant the, Killer. Yeah, that's right. That, <laughs> Hollywood is a weird... It's just an entangled web. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Hollywood eats its own, I think. Yeah. Well, it's just like you become a, successful in one movie, they automatically want you in another movie. Uh, they just because they think it's going to carry over. But I think we've we've reached our time limit this evening. Um, those two movies, Jack uh, the Giant Killer and Abraham Lincoln the Vampire Hunter, not much out other than the trailer for the first film and the posters and some photos of Abraham Lincoln. Out. We'll keep you posted on everything else. I want to thank um, our guest tonight. Um, and everybody go check out his book, uh, worldofzombies.com, theworldofzombies.com. Um, it's great stuff. Um, and Paul should be back hopefully next week. Are we, do, are we doing a show next week? Uh, but I want everybody to stay tuned um, to the site because we have a very, 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 very special guest interview coming up. Um next week as well i'll be posting that on the website soon to give you a heads up on it and if you haven't already please go sign up we now have a newsletter um there you you can go to the website zombiepopcorn.com and sign up for the newsletter we're going to start doing exclusive contests through there um and other content so if you want to be in on that sign up for the newsletter other than that it's been a great show yeah you never said you never said his full name ross payton ross payton yeah yeah, that um, was a fun interview. I could that, geek out on games. You online. did geek out on games. <laughs> I am such a nerd, man. I <laughs> I love that shit. I don't know what it is. Something about rolling a D twenty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's so cool about it. Well, we'll we'll leave the show with that. We'll let Bob roll his D twenty. Y'all have a good night. All right, good night. <laughs> bye bye.